Rolling. This is where I said I say all the stupid stuff that you just include in the <laughs> the cold open. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Reaction, your weekly source for independent commentary on cultural news and politics, where it's always our mission to arm you with the tools you need to cut through media misdirection and resist the mononarrative. I am here with my esteemed colleagues, David Rand, Kyle Mack, and Bennett. Thank you so much for joining us. David, what are we talking about today? Our boy, our beautiful, beautiful baby boy, Liam McCollum, has been killing it, absolutely killing it, and we're going to be talking to him about all the great stuff he's been doing, Defend the Guard, Donald Trump, in Bozeman, the Montana Senate race, all that stuff. He's going to be coming over, we're going to be interviewing him. Um, Next up, Donald Trump and Elon Musk had a conversation, and a lot of people were mad about it. Imagine that. That's as uh, as usual. A lot of people watched it, too. (laughs) (laughs) Big numbers. Just a casual Billy, you know? Just 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 a casual Billy. Just a casual Billy. A Billy, a Billy, a Billy. (laughs) All of your social security numbers turned out to be about as secure as Trump at a Pennsylvania rally. Ooh. (laughs) Ooh. Is that too soon? (laughs) Speaking of, (laughs) one in five (laughs) Americans believe the FBI was behind the Trump assassination attempt. We got an interesting poll about that. Uh, And World War III. Is it going to happen, or is it all just one big apocalypse tease? That doesn't even seem like news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've been talking about this for nine months. Yeah. And behind the skiff, uh, so if you want to know what's really going on, you got to join us in our secure containment information facility uh, known as Substack or whatever. Um, or YouTube members. Or YouTube members. We'll be talking about uh, uh, reports that RFK Jr. is going to be joining the Kamala cabinet, or at least asking to great big betrayal of his RFK fans potentially and we're going to be reviewing some interesting developments on the Nord Stream pipeline story which the Wall Street Journal came out with an exclusive that seems to trying to be move the ball forward it might be a big op it's a it has all the telltale signs of a potential CIA op. well and, so. and to tease that out a little bit there is combat dolphins also also There's we discovered dolphins we discovered and, the and real information <laughs> So we can't get There's the other of dolphins. <laughs> you want to talk to the dolphin? You talk to me. <laughs> Ace Ventura, pet detective, the first one. Yeah. It's a great one. Yeah, it's a great and one. Uh, before we get into all of that, before we get into the combat dolphins and the spy whales, <laughs> uh, how World War Three will be fought: robots and combat <laughs> just, dolphins. Just, uh, just imagine that: just drones flying about, just scared of drones, and you get in the water. Combat dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in to order to see us talk about that, you have to go to the skiff and to figure out how to get into there you gotta be a member so through our Substack or our youtube and uh to join go to humanreactionpod.com and you can see all that but also if you're just if you're a normie listener uh like follow subscribe hit the notification bell leave us a review do all the things on whichever platform you're on and also you can join our discord where you can chat with us and you can post dank memes like this one the british then big chad british dog I'm going to run an empire that spans a quarter of the Earth's land mass and 23% of the population. The British now, you know. Please stop saying mean please things stop online. Please saying mean things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not bad. That was a good British accent. That well, was good. Thank that you. was pretty good. <laughs> I, tr- I try. I try. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. This episode is brought to you by Revved Up Promo, the official apparel partner of Human Reaction. Revved Up is a premier full-service shop specializing in laser engraving, screen printing, and embroidery. Not only are they now making all of our apparel right down the road from us, they can do the same for your brand and ship it to you anywhere in the world. Revved Up helps you navigate the extensive universe of merch options and uses state-of-the-art techniques to showcase your brand in its very best light. So if you want to support our show, and our generous sponsor, you can now do so by buying our merch and by turning to Revved Up Promo for your own custom apparel needs. Reach them at revveduppromo.com. That's with two V's and two P's, or just check the show notes for a link. But now... 
let's get in with our boy Liam. Let's do it. Let's do it. We because got me, Liam. me and him just went to the Trump rally last week and it was a fun time. But Liam did some extra special stuff at the Trump rally. He certainly did. And we are pleased to be joined by our friend Liam right now. Liam, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm doing great. It's been a crazy week and I'm, I'm glad to now officially be a part of the show. I announced it on Dave Smith's podcast yesterday that we have officially partnered and I'm going to be putting out some content under my own channel under the Liam McCollum show. It will still exist and everyone should subscribe to me over there uh, at the Liam McCollum show on YouTube, all other platforms, but it's officially under the human reaction brand. And I'm very thankful for you guys for this. Absolutely, man. And we're so glad to have you and glad to, to join forces. I mean, there's not too many of us libertarians in general, and certainly not you know that many, especially within just the state of Montana. You've been a good friend of ours uh, and a you know promoter of the show for a long time, and we really appreciate you sharing that. And we're happy to join forces and bring some production stuff to the table and help you reach more audiences, which you definitely deserve because you're doing great work, uh, and we appreciate you for doing that. Well, it's crazy yeah, to just you. get in on a Dave Smith show. Like that's crazy. Yeah, right? and congratulations yeah. by the way. Yeah, what we're a so cool thing. For you. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, saw it, it just yeah, posted it was, it was this awesome. morning. So. Dave's, Dave's great. We, you know, we, we met at in D.C. Joe was there and he actually filmed uh, my first interview of Dave. And um, I'm, I'm actually hoping to have him on as one of the first guests under the HR brand. Oh, just this young guy coming and getting Dave Smith for one of his first <laughs> guests. Okay, yeah. He's so much better at podcasting than us. It's not fair. <laughs> Goddamn. Well, it helps that Liam Gen has 30,000 Twitter followers. That's yeah, true. It, it helps. True. It helps. The best Twitter maker producer what, is, what what do you do on twitter tweeter that's not the word what's well, the, what's the we'll workshop it we'll workshop it off <laughs> it's not twitter anymore yeah. x don't, poster don't, don't, oh good we're just it. dead naming the shit out of it aren't we oh geez that's why we can't get big that's right <laughs> elon won't allow it because we keep dead naming his platform uh liam so so talk us through this week what ha what happened just start from the top well i'll actually start a little bit before then i uh, a couple months ago i decided to reach out to diego rivera dan mcknight and uh dave smith it was actually in the context of him wanting to have me on his show and i was just thinking about the things that i i really care about the things that i you know uh talk about and have sort of specialized in and i thought that i i should write an article about the defend the guard act and being that i'm going to be in law school uh, next legislative session and I won't actively be able to um, lobby for it like I did last legislative session. I was like, well, what can I do to make the biggest impact possible to help out Representative Lee Deming, who's the sponsor here in the state, um, get it passed. And and so I decided I should write a, an article um, calling on Donald Trump to endorse the Defend the Guard Act. Uh, and the the idea wasn't just that you know, me as a 24 year old, you know, has some sway with Donald Trump, the former president of the United States. The idea was that I would go around and, and go to all of like the big influencers that I met, like Dave Smith, Angela McArdle, Scott Horton, you know, Joe Kent, uh, Dave DeCamp. And there's so many big names that I reached out to. And um, basically they would sign on to this appeal to have Donald Trump endorse the defend the guard act and so that's what i did I, I ended up writing an article basically appealing to him from both a libertarian and a conservative perspective because he came to our convention in dc and he tried to um, make the case for why libertarians should support him so i said well you know if you're interested in our ideas this is something that is really impactful and it's actually it, it might actually do more than any other pledge that you can make you know he, he's making pledges to free Ross Ulbricht. He's making pledges to put uh, a libertarian in his cabinet. And a lot of libertarians have questioned if he's actually going to do that. A lot of libertarians are like, oh, well, as soon as he gets elected, incentives change. He could always fire the cabinet member. And so what I what I said is if if you simply just endorse this legislation, it builds trust with libertarians because it'll put it on the map across the entire country and right. in many red states it will actually get it passed and i guess for for people who don't know and and for people who haven't checked out uh, my appearance on dave's podcast the, the defend the guard act is legislation that would prohibit uh the national guard from being sent overseas 
to uh, foreign wars if Congress hasn't first declared a war. Um, so yeah, I uh, on Friday, I went to the Trump rally, just, you know, perfect timing. I was planning to publish this article the following Monday, and he shows up in, in Montana at the Trump rally. And I uh, printed off a copy of it, and I got to meet with Tim Sheehy. Um, Angela McArdle, the national chair of the party, helped arrange a meeting with the Trump campaign and the Tim Sheehy campaign. Um, Sid Dowd and I went. Sid Dowd's the Senate candidate in Montana for the Libertarian Party. And I met with Tim Sheehy and I I gave him this letter uh, and, and basically made the case. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that, you know, it, it was only like two days later that he actually endorsed it publicly. So I've been trying to make the case that the Libertarian Party actually has like pretty big influence in the culture right now. And we should we should absolutely use our leverage to to move the Overton window a bit. Um, I, I actually, if we want to, I have the video in the notes right here, Joe, if we want to showcase uh, Tim Sheehy publicly endorsing it. Let's do that. It's uh, actually the bottom link on the section here, the Sheehy endorsed DTG. And Got it. while you bring it up, uh, some quick background for our non-Montana listeners. Uh, so we have a very close potential Senate race with the incumbent John Tester being up for re-election. Tim Sheehy is kind of the RNC pick of sorts. He was endorsed by Trump, uh, who is now going to be running again, is now running against John Tester. Um, and it's really big deal. It's a really big deal that he would come out and support or defend the guard. Yeah, well, and, and there is a lot of background there where uh, libertarians in general have been quite skeptical of a lot of foreign policy stances that Sheehy has been. Um, For good reason. Yeah, generally war hawkishness with Iran, but also earlier on in his campaign, there was a lot of things where you're kind of like, oh, you're sounding kind of Nikki Haley-ish. Yeah, you know, like yeah. there, there's so a lot there, of that that's going on. there was an actual post, uh, Tim Sheehy on his LinkedIn, he came out and said uh, that we should send anything we can to Ukraine to help support them. He said, mm -hmm. we need boots on the ground. We mm -hmm. need ammunition we need equipment being sent and and so that was the biggest thing that the montana libertarian party would just was just like trying to amplify like look guys he he clearly supported this war um he has since retracted that position he says that uh you know he's taking more of an america first stance and i think that's because of you know tr trump's endorsement he trump has come out against that war and the the maga base in general is is opposed to the ukraine war but he has definitely signaled that he would potentially support a war with Iran. You know, I, I personally told him in, in this meeting that that's my biggest concern that I think, you know, I, I would be, you know, I'm very worried that he would support the war in Iran. And he, he said that uh, he's also worried about it and that he doesn't think that we can afford another war. Um, but I was sort of disappointed because uh, about an hour later, he gets up on stage and says that the moment he became a Trump supporter was when Trump bombed Qasem Soleimani. And, you know, I do think that he could make a logical, like, you know, exception there. Like, I think he could carve that out and say there are like times where it's fine to like take out leaders or whatever. Yeah. And and so I'm giving him like I'm trying to yeah. be gracious and okay, maybe he opposes war with Iran and and maybe he's just fine with taking out leaders. But yeah, so that's the general context for where why we're like distrustful of him. So yeah. yeah, let's play this. Uh, the she he, we can just play like the first like thirty seconds here. We don't have to go in. He goes into a much longer discussion about constitution and history and stuff like that. And it's a great which, which is actually a very good, well thought out response. But we can just play the first like thirty seconds for sure. Show. And and you know just a little bit of context personally around this. Like I did not expect that Tim Sheehy had this amount of depth to his rationale mm -hmm. here. I kind of expected he would he would just try to you know endorse it or i mean say what he said but then kind of just brush it off and move on to the next thing but he really does dig in here to his credit so we'll, we'll take a look we're very fortunate tonight to have representative lee deming here and lee deming carried a bill in the house of representatives and this was the bill it was called defend the guard it was a very simple bill it says that we're going to deploy national guard troops to a foreign theater we need a formal declaration of war by the united states congress and I called several of my friends that had served. Every one of them supported that. And uh, Tim Lee Deming wanted to hear you talk about that. Yep. Well, thanks, Lee. Uh, short answer, yes, support 100%. And, and to get some context there, anybody you know what the only constitutionally mandated branch of the military is? Who? Oh, who said that? Yeah. And then yeah, we can probably cut it. He goes into a pretty yeah. well 
well thought out kind of reasoning on his rationale and also important to note because you mentioned lee deming a lot on your part of the problem uh episode uh (laughs) that he was the one that kind of brought you into all the libertarian stuff so it's kind of interesting to see all that full circle right there liam yeah uh, you know diego rivera the the guy from bring our troops home uh, and everyone should check out bringourtroopshome.us. They're the organization pushing uh, the Defend the Guard legislation around the country. He's like, uh, he, he has consistently told me this is the most beautiful story in American politics. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as luck. There's just providence is what he said when he saw this. Because, mm. you know, he he got me interested in, in libertarian ideas, but I got him interested in the Defend the Guard Act. And now he's the sponsor of the bill. So it's mm. it's kind of crazy that, you know, I'm the one who's, giving Tim Sheehy the talking points that you're seeing in this video. And then the next or two days later, he's he's endorsing it publicly in front of uh, Lee. And and I will say when when I had the conversation with him and I led led uh, him through the document and explained the concept, why we wanted Trump to endorse it, he said pretty much the same stuff here. Like, I I think that he had been seriously kind of contending with uh, with these ideas for a while. I had actually um, sent this letter to his campaign uh, and and had tried to get them on board as a signatory um, along with some other Montana representatives because my case was like, look, Sid Dowd, your, com- your competitor has endorsed this. He signed on to it. If you want to win over libertarian supporters, you should get on, on with this bill. And I told him that in person. I, I said, I mean, because like, it's just obvious, like the incentives are such that he probably wanted Sid Dowd to drop out, right? But what I told him is I can't commit to you that. I can't commit to you that the Montana Libertarian Party would support you. I can't commit to you that the officers would support you. But what I can commit to you is like all of our ideas. If like, I'm an open book, if you want to hear what I believe, you're welcome to call me up and I'll give you all the talking points to convince libertarians at large. And I mean, he's demonstrated that he's at least interested in doing it for the Defend the Guard Act. We'll see if he makes some other commitments. I think there's something there too with, uh, it showcases the recent shift in libertarian strategy of taking this leverage play where in the past, a lot of libertarian folks have kind of just been like, well, they're not perfect on X and Y issue. So therefore we can't work with them. And there's kind of like this, like zero compromise type of mentality that often exists within the libertarian sphere where now there's been a shift where it's like, okay, we have these lists of grievances with these candidates. We're not, we have to be realistic about where we're at right now. We can get them to move the needle on various handful of issues and we can work together and have some sort of level of compromise and push the needle towards very important issues, right? And I think this example right here is one of those things where Sid is a bit of a roadblock where he's taking a few points away from Sheehy in the race in a, in a very important race. The Republicans really have to contend with that. And this is a way for them to be like, okay, guys, like we have a lot of, there's a Venn diagram here with the libertarians that exist. We have some differences, but this is one of those issues right here, right? Um, where we can, we can move. And it's also one of these things where it naturally fits in with the MAGA America first mentality of, of, uh, of kind of putting this power back to the states and focusing like why are we sending our national guard to places like ukraine when we could be putting them here and defending our issues right um it's it's such a great strategic move i think and i think exactly what you just said is it's very important that like the libertarian party actually provides and demonstrates that they're willing to use both the carrot and the stick so i do think that there are cases where you actually do need to say look you've come far enough we are willing to drop out and support you. And Sid Dowd, the Senate candidate uh, for the Libertarian Party in Montana, has openly said that if Matt Rosendale had been the candidate in this race that had won the primary, he would have dropped out and supported him. And, you know, I would have commended him for that decision. And, you know, Matt Rosendale recently, I I met with him in Washington, D.C., and I gave him a copy of End the Fed. And now he is like a a huge supporter of End the Fed legislation. He's co-sponsoring it with Thomas Massey, and he's constantly tweeting out End the Fed and and stuff like that. So, like, I, I think that Matt Rosendale's is the the sort of candidate that we would want to do that with. Like, I would never advise uh, a libertarian to run against someone like that or run against someone like 
uh, Rand Paul. Whereas in the past, I think that we've we've kind of had partisans in in the party yeah. where where they're like, oh, okay, well, like what we what matters more is institutional power and the fact that the Libertarian Party is getting candidates elected. And and I think this strategy is is much different and is more results oriented. And so like with Tim Sheehy though, it's like you know if if you don't get to that point where we trust you, you know, like this is a case where maybe you actually do have to use this stick. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where, where that is right now. I'm not sure what Sid thinks about that, but you know, at the very least, I want to be able to have like an open dialogue with him where he's like, where I tell him like, these are the things we need to hear. And I'm, I'm not being hostile. Like I really want to be a friendly party who is encouraging and kind of challenging you to beat Sid. Like I want you to be a better libertarian than Sid. Um, and so that's, that's the, the difference of the old guard and our, our strategy, I think. Well, and that's the, liber- that, that's the opportunity. You're showing up at the table rather than just not showing up at all. And yeah. so that way you can actually play the game and get the results and move the, move the needle. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're like, hey, Republicans, here's how you earn my vote. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> right. yeah. Instead of just not participating. Right. Right? right. Well, and speaking of Sid, too, I mean, he was invited to the table. Uh, was he not, Liam? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I we went to this rally. We got VIP tickets and everything. It was it was amazing, you know. And and there's a there's an article I should say. There's an article uh, that's going around Montana right now that is painting this like we were unwilling partners in this. That like we were brought here, we were pressured to do this, and and Sid was pressured to drop out and. Really, I think that's a, a really big mischaracterization of what happened. I had reached out to Angela McArdle earlier in the week, trying to arrange a meeting with Tim Sheehy and Donald Trump to talk about issues. Like, like we were going there, and we we had no intention of dropping out. We had every intention of spreading ideas, and I had every intention of talking to them about the Defend the Guard Act. But um, in the, in this next clip you have pulled up, uh, uh, you know, Sid got pulled behind stage. And I'm, I'm really kicking myself because if I would have been with Sid at this moment, I'm pretty sure I would have been behind stage too. But uh, I stepped away for a second and then I saw Steve Daines whisked him away. And uh, so he goes backstage, meets with Trump for a little bit. Uh, they talk about issues. And then <laughs> uh, this clip is what happened while Trump was speaking. We're really a party of common sense, if you think. We're conservative and all that, but we're really a party of common sense. And by the way, we have a great libertarian with us tonight. Where is our libertarian friend? And I think he's going to be with us. Where is he? What a nice guy. Sit, will you stand up, please. Stand up. What a nice guy. What a nice guy. A lot of us are libertarian. And uh, I think he's going to be giving you a very nice surprise very soon. But he's a great, wonderful person. And we just uh, met and we knew each other a little bit from before. Thank you very much for being here. How do you like the audience? Not, not bad. Do you think the libertarians get this kind of audience? I don't think so. Every time. But thank you. you. can't help it. Great honor to know you. Thank you very much. But we'll bring back safety, security, and the American dream. I will say that was a pretty epic moment. I was just up and to the left of that. And then you and Sid were kind of 90 degree angle from Trump right there. And I I remember the people I was sitting with who were kind of privy to knowing what was going on there. Yeah. Here's, here's actually my, my angle here. Um, I zoomed in on on Ronnie Jackson because I was trying to find Sid, (laughs) but and you, you can see me with my phone behind him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it was one of those things where we were just like, oh, my oh my God, this is happening. Like, yeah. we didn't expect there to be a call out that, that occurred right there. Yeah. Well, it, it, it cool. is really funny. Like, a minute before this, I was like, it would be so Trumpian of him to call out Sid right now. And then he did. And I, I was really bummed that I didn't get my phone yeah. out. Because, like, he has called out people just, like, randomly in the audience before. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought of it. But well, so he, uh, he's, he alludes I didn't to... expect him to actually, like, say, like, oh, we have libertarian ideas. And, oh, like, you know, like, Sid's a great libertarian. But it's pretty awesome. And, and what is he alluding to? Obviously, uh, something in particular when he says, um, oh, I think he's going to have a great surprise for you very soon. Uh, is, I assume he's alluding to like Sid might drop out, right? I mean, I mean, like that's like what I'm speculating. I mean, that, I think that's what a lot of people are speculating, but I, I really don't know all the details of what were discussed. Uh, I know that when when Sid and I went there, the intention was 
not to drop out. Sid had no intention of dropping out. And really, we went there to talk about the Defend the Guard Act, uh, to talk about the fact that we do we oppose Lindsey Graham's resolution to go to war with Iran, that we support, you know, Thomas Massey's bill to end the Department of Education, that we support his bill to end the Fed and that we support Rand Paul's bill to abolish the draft and like like we we came to talk about policy and to say look like I you know the incentives here are such that you want us to drop out that's not going to happen but you can compete for our voters and we'll help you do it because we, we we do want to influence the culture in Montana and I, I think we already are doing it based off of Tim Sheehy's endorsement of what has been largely just like libertarian efforts yeah. uh you know the Defend the Guard Act has been pushed and endorsed by libertarian affiliates all around the country. And yes, it gets like like it's introduced by Republicans and stuff. But uh, and, and like we, we do have GOPs uh, that are endorsing it, like the Texas GOP did, the Montana GOP did. But I think like in the cultural space, it's largely known as like a libertarian bill. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just phenomenal that like if, if Tim Sheehy, Sheehy were to get elected, he'd be the second elected u.s senator to support this bill you know it, it, i think a lot of people would look at it and say like oh there's no way trump would do that like promise a big announcement if there wasn't a big announcement but that's exactly what he, he does that all the time that's exactly. the best this, television yeah. well this is also part of a negotiation tactic right and things like right, that, right 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 so it's a it's a way to put pressure on it's a way to like tease the his viewers his base the people around him like something interesting is going to happen that's that's television I, man. that's how you well, do that's how you I, what, I, what i hope the the announcement is is that you know libertarians and the gop are going to coalition on defend the guard i hope the announcement uh, yeah. and, and that's that's actually it. what i think it is just because like i i've been talking with some people in back channels over the last week since the event and i would not be surprised to see a donald trump uh endorsement of like public endorsement of defend the guard uh before the campaign is over I, I would not be surprised by that i mean to me that would be a really smart continuation of the courtship that he has already embarked upon exactly. for libertarian voters i mean mm -hmm. free ross pardon julian assange you know libertarian in the cabin all this stuff this would be like a really deliberate policy objective that libertarians care a lot about uh, for him to sign on to. And, uh, and, you know, obviously it comes with a little bit more political capital. Do you feel like that's a calculation that they're making? Like, do we want to go against the same generals that showed up in, you know, the Montana legislature to try to oppose this thing yep. in uniform? Like, how do you think the Trump campaign's thinking about that, Liam? Well, I, I mean, I think that they're probably seeing that there are a bunch of, and, and I hope they're reading my article. I mean, I know that Angela McArdle has given my article to the Trump campaign. And, and they're probably seeing that all of the sponsors on the bill are like America first Trump supporting Republicans, like big names like Joe Kent, who's a congressional candidate, or, you know, Anthony Sabatini, who was running for Congress, who's now running for local office. Uh, Wendy Rogers is a big name uh, out of Arizona who supports this bill. Um, I, th I believe Carrie Lake has praised this bill before, too, and it's been endorsed by like Vivek Ramaswamy, Tulsi Gabbard. It, it was just endorsed by RFK also due to libertarian yeah. efforts that, you know, the Montana Libertarian Party had just given the RFK campaign a questionnaire where we're trying to release like a scorecard that ranks presidential candidates. And we had just given him a questionnaire with Defend the Guard as our primary focus. And he endorsed it like two days later mm. publicly wow. on on Twitter. So I, I think what he's what he's seeing right now is that really this just is an America first bill. And, and what I write in this article is, uh, you know, Trump has these instincts already. He tried to withdraw from Syria and his generals bragged about lying to him. And, you know, like what what get there, there's nothing more America first than wanting your National Guard at home to defend against natural disasters than, you know, defending the border of Syria. And and with this like Texas uh, spat at the border right now where the Texas National Guard were being used to erect uh, barriers to prevent you know, what they perceive to be an invasion on their southern border. And then the Biden administration comes in and tears them down and then later sends National Guard over to Syria. And we, we recently had two Georgia National Guardsmen killed in Iraq. We had uh, we had uh, National Guardsmen from Arizona that were fired upon on the Syria and Jordan border border. And it's just like you look at that and you're like, OK, there's an immigration crisis at our southern border right now where I mean, it's just a humanitarian crisis. And, you know, I think everyone, even John Tester is now talking about the border. Um, so it's like, 
that's going on. But meanwhile, we're defending oil in Syria and trying to, you know, we're using them as like pawns and potential to justify a potential future war with Iran. Like, like I think people are starting to wake up to the fact that this is just like backwards, entirely backwards. And so I think if Trump is interested in this and if he is alluding to the fact that he might endorse it, it's because it's just like the most America first thing that he could do. Well, and there's another thing, and you mentioned this on the Dave Smith podcast when you were with him talking about it, but uh, using conservative America first arguments for the sake of the bill when you're talking about conservatives. And one of the best examples that you used was uh, when Hurricane Katrina happened, that you had like 3,000 National Guard uh, out of Louisiana and overseas when Hurricane Katrina happened and Louisiana had to beg all the other states to send their National Guardsmen down to help yeah. out with the with the disaster. So it's 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 like just such, such a clear example of like, OK, we have this at home standing militia here and they're elsewhere when actual disaster strikes. Yeah. Right? I mean, he, even here in Montana, you know, I, I need to actually look at the timeline to make sure that this is correct. But uh, I think it was either last year or the year before uh, we had. Uh, Montana National Guard go over to Syria. Um, and at the time, I'm, I'm fairly certain we were either dealing with floods or wildfires. But even if we weren't, like the principle of it is that Montana is always vulnerable to these things. And instead, they're over in Syria and it's for an undeclared war. Like it'd be one thing if Congress had actually declared war and properly mo mobilized the guard under the constitution but but they haven't and you know I, i've done a lot of research on the defend the guard act uh in, in my classes in, in law school i i defended this in a uh moot court hearing i've done research and in legal internships on it and the reality is is that the founding era like they they intentionally made the national guard state militia that would not be controlled by the federal government uh during normal circumstances they only they limited it they limited federal authority over the national guard to three circumstances and it was uh to defend against invasions defend against insurrections and to enforce the laws of the union and outside of that they would be used for whatever the states deemed necessary um so so that that's sort of like the constitutional and like conservative argument for for why the defend the guard act is important because you know we're we're very far away from the original purpose of of what the national guard and the state militia are i mean they were they were 45 percent of the fighting force during the global war on terror historically this is not how the militia was used it was only after uh vietnam that that the federal government started abusing them this way so this is a very recent phenomenon and i think with the current supreme court which is very interested in you know like historical uh like uses and like historical traditions and uh founding principles i think that there's a really strong case that the founders were warning against federal abu abuse of of the militia and that's part of the reason why the second amendment stresses the militia as well mm -hmm. it's a great case that's really interesting yeah no I, I hope that this picks up some traction i mean it seems like the story at least is is catching the right wavelengths i mean obviously uh this was i believe late last night Breitbart uh, published an article about this, heavily citing you as well. Uh, which uh, congratulations on that! Another another great like media opportunity for you around this. Um, really cool to see, and I mean, like this is the sort of publication that's on the tier that would get national attention to the extent that Trump might actually see it, might see that it's picking up steam, and might actually you know make some action happen inside the campaign. Don't you think? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I was surprised to see Breitbart report on this. I mean, this early into our effort, um, but I actually found out that the the reporter here, um, he he was following me and he DM me and said that he's been a supporter of the Defend the Guard Act for a long time. And he uh, he first heard about it while listening to Scott Horton's show a while ago. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's cool to see. And I, I really do hope that the right people see this. Absolutely. And uh, another uh, example of the coalition that's kind of forming here of all yeah. these different groups coming together yeah. towards some sort of compromise, common cause. Right. Yeah. Well, actually, on one separate note, if we can take a detour for a second, speaking of coalitions, we've seen a lot of RFK Jr. Uh, courting libertarians. He was at the LNC. He was at Freedom Fest, you know, giving keynote speeches. Uh, and then it was just recently within the last like 48 hours. It seems like there's some deal on the table between the RFK Jr. camp and the Kamala camp that, you know, he would get some sort of cabinet position if he throws 
his support behind her and drops out of the race. Is that shocking to anybody else, given how he's been courting the right so heavily as well? And it seems like just, you know, right before the RNC, he was having a conversation with Trump. It feels like uh, Bernie endorsing Clinton. Like there's some pressure applied to him at this point. Well, I'd be more disappointed in this one than Bernie. Oh, for sure. But but it's like uh, like Ron Paul never caved and endorsed John McCain. Right. He didn't he didn't do that. But then you have kind of these the dissident heroes of the left. They do like if they do cave, you know, it's you know, there's just a different dynamic there. That's interesting. Right. I I did see that Nicole Shanahan denied it. And that could just be because, you know, like it and it looked so bad, you know, they they might be trying to get ahead of it is anonymous reporting from a supposed staffer insider. Right. It's not yeah. an official act of the campaign. Right. So, so, so yeah. maybe it's something like Trump saying only a staffer saying well, we're going to, we, you know, we got something very special. He might, might give you a special surprise. It's like yeah. the Kamala campaign saying RFK might give you a special but, surprise. But this is also <laughs> something that happens actually, in politics all the time exactly is, is, is people I mean, leaking like, out false information. Like campaigns actively leak mm-hmm. out false information yes. to get media hubbub. Right. Is that how you're seeing it, Liam? Yeah, because I mean, I think like with what we're trying to do with the Sid Dowd campaign, I mean, like I've I've said that we should try to reach out to Tester and try to get him to endorse the Defend the Guard Act. But that doesn't mean that uh, I want Sid Dowd to drop out to endorse John Tester. So it could have been something like that, like that they were just having a conversation. I mean, I know I know RFK reached out to Trump before the RNC and they had a long conversation, but I think it was ultimately RFK who said that he he wasn't going to join the ticket. So. Hopefully it's just like a more like this sentiment that we're seeing that we need more dialogue in the country. I, I don't know if that's what it is, but it's my hope. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems like if nothing else, you know, this might uh, relight some kind of fire from the Trump campaign to have that conversation again or to see if there's another way to to uh, work together. Because obviously we've got a lot of like policy position stealing going on mm-hmm. right now. You know, it's like the no taxes on tips thing. Was, Kamala was, is just like, it's my idea. It was now. originally Ron Paul, obviously as <laughs> has been mentioned, but then like Trump picks it up and then Kamala stole it, you know, and like, uh, you know, RFK has been stealing Trump's lines and Trump's been stealing RFK's lines. Like they're all, they're all vying for if, the if, same if, voters. If Trump's stealing from Ron Paul, I'm happy. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone steals from Ron Paul. Exactly. Yeah. If, if Kamala is stealing from Ron Paul, I'm happy. And, th- yeah. and that's kind of the principle that I'm like trying to lead with is like, I just want the defend the guard act to be in like the popular discourse. And if yeah. John Tesler comes out there and he endorses it because it's pro veteran, then like good. Cause then that means that the three Senate can or Senate candidates for Montana are behind it. And then we can actually like court Democrats who oppose this bill in the house only two democrats voted for it in the house but uh i I would imagine that this is like the most like like the issue that democrats care about the most like especially with you know their concerns over what what i think are concerns over like a future war with iran and like the humanitarian concerns about war like where the anti-war left go yeah Right. Yeah, I mean, you you would think that uh, they wouldn't want natu- uh, uh, National Guard troops fighting in Gaza if that were to be an eventual outcome. Right. So, yeah. And, and I mean, I have to imagine Tester's feeling a bit of pressure on this issue, particularly because he has been so forward about veterans' issues, but under attack a lot, too, from, you know, veterans' organizations. Trump, Trump brought Ronnie Jackson to the rally to eviscerate Trump because Ronnie Jackson was the guy that... Uh, that to uh, eviscerate tester or sorry to eviscerate tester okay. yeah sorry because uh tester was the guy that led the charge towards him not becoming the lead of the of the veteran affairs oh and uh so ronnie jackson came in and just like eviscerated just uh, talking about how corrupt he was and wow. all this stuff it was it was pretty crazy so well, i mean tester's feeling the heat i think yeah yeah like like john tester he like the reason he has a reputation for supporting veterans is because of his va work but i mean like my my thinking here is like you need to actually cut at the root of the veteran problem which is that we have these endless wars that john tester supports he has supported you know all of these war power or he has voted against all of these war powers resolutions to try to bring our troops home and so like instead of sending our men and women overseas to come back home broken from these endless wars john tester is trying to fix this socialist va system and that's not where you're going to find the problem we have to we actually have to strike at the root and 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 end these wars uh and only fight when necessary and only fight defensive wars because if if we the only way we really project strength as a country is economically and i think 
by being an empire, we are like uh, stealing from our country and stealing from our soul just to like enrich other countries. And uh, I think everyone kind of feels that like uh, Dave Smith mentioned this, that like uh, the soul of the country has been depleted by these foreign conflicts. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would hope that John Tester uh, sees what's happening and that he is persuaded by what we're doing. Well, we can only hope. And I think there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity there. Uh, I really love what you're doing, Liam, really pumped about all the progress that you're making. Keep up the good work, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining the team. Thanks for everything you do, brother. You're doing a great job. Thank you. And, and yeah, and if you haven't seen them with the Dave on Dave Smith, check it out. It's great. Check yeah. it out. Yeah. And the future one coming with Scott Horton. Yes, yes sir. TBD. TBD. Yeah. <laughs> all right. See you later, buddy. Later, Liam. Thank you. And next up, the EU is losing its mind right now, specifically Great Britain more so than other places. But the EU uh, is losing its mind, writing a letter to Elon Musk before the Trump interview, uh, basically saying, hey, you're going to be speaking to this guy and you might say something back. And that could open you up to legal liabilities, perhaps, you know, very, very Trump, uh, not Trump, very mafia, like Mm. very... Uh, Very hey, bureau. it'd be a shame if someone were to come into your shop and things would start getting lit on fire and breaking. We wouldn't want anybody to get hurt here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> your accents are on point well, today. Well done, sir. I'm yeah, on, I'm on point. Working on them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that the Trump interview was very interesting. It was, uh, you know, we'll get into actual the details of it. We're going to do some reaction stuff to it. Uh, but the initial was, you know, a related dialogue on the UK right now. Riots in the UK continue to go on. Uh, the social media crackdown has been pervasive. Um, I have this clip from uh, GB News uh, kind of demonstrating the dialogue that elite corporate media is having about social media in the UK. And I think this really shows the philosophy behind this bureaucrat writing the letter and how they think about it. Tim, what did you make of what James had to say? Uh, I understand where he's coming from. The, the concern is that Labour will probably do one, uh, one of two things, or both. One is to push this idea of something being legal but harmful. So it's, it's technically legal, but it still does harm. So, it, so it a third category control. of speech. Precisely. And the other thing is uh, more robust hate crime laws, perhaps a new definition of Islamophobia and things like that. Mm. So it becomes easier to catch people. Um, I, think the simp- I think the much more straightforward solution is to finally make social media platforms treated as a publisher. I work for the Daily Telegraph. If someone writes a racist letter to my newspaper, we wouldn't publish it. If we did publish it, we'd be held directly responsible for it. But, Why but can't social would, media firms because, be Tim, held that responsible? That would mean Elon Musk or one of his, would his go employees out going of through business. every yes. single tweet. He would put him on his page. You're, you're just trying to shut Twitter down. Yeah, that's my point. Goodness you can afford to employ some moderators. I know he sacked the last few, but yeah, good. Recruitment drive for Elon. But, but, but you, you tweet. I sometimes tweet. Right. I don't Would you like to wait racial 24 hatred? hours for your tweets to be approved and published? I could, I could cope not? with that. I could cope with that. What's wrong well, with well, that? That's destroying conversation online. So... Well, my goodness me. I mean, we're having a conversation. We're having a perfectly good, self-moderated, legal conversation right I now. Why do you need to have a right to have a... Why do you need to have a This is a horseshoe of liberalism. Why do you need to have the right to have an offensive conversation online? Why, because, why is because that so important It's to? not even about why offensive. Why it's about legality. Ask? Anything that you can't legally shout in the street, you can't say online. It's as simple as that. Kistam hasn't brought in a load yes. of new laws. But, He's but, just but, saying but, the things that apply to the actual world apply to the social media. Media, media is only world. 10 years old, Tom, and you seem to have developed the idea that it's some sort of Bill of Rights or Magna Carta online that you have the your right to appear on Your arguments were those that were used to, to, to shut Voltaire up when he dared to speak against the church. Why? Your arguments are the same. No. You say, why on earth should anyone be offensive? I'm not it shutting down. It is offensive down. speech. It is precisely offensive speech it's that has moved societies it's, it's, forward. I'm not shutting anyone down on the basis of the content of their speech. I'm simply saying that you must have, you are responsible for what you say, and a publication is responsible for having <laughs> no, a visual is responsible for what they say on a platform yes. if you are to say and is the that platform not responsible for inviting them to speak on it is the town square responsible for what some lunatic yells in the corner of it it's not the same the town square is not privately owned by a multi-billionaire in california that's why it should be able to be what the private owner decides it should be 
But but once again, like <sighs> this this is the, you he he dropped the cards right there, right? Like he's like, I don't want it to exist. I don't think that you have a right to speak online. In fact, it should only be cultivated voices with official media narratives should be allowed to speak. Uh, imagine a world or Twitter. You have to wait a 24 hour holding period on every <laughs> single tweet. Well, just imagine. Imagine the Trump assassination. Yeah, exactly. Time. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say is like, imagine all the information flow that was going on and kind of like the real time debunking that was happening. And we would have had to wait a day to be able to get any of that. Oh my God. That's, that's so crazy. I can't believe. I mean, when he was like, I don't want to moderate you based on the content of what you're saying. I just don't want you to be able to say hateful things. And it's like, <laughs> you're, you're, can you, are you, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> are you listening to yourself? Or is there a 24 hour waiting period in your brain for you to <laughs> coordinate what's actually happening here? I'm kind of retarded. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. So Man. that's, that's the dialogue in the UK right now. And it's, it's, I mean, I appreciate the host of that show actually pushing yeah, back yeah. With, with well said and well done. Um, it is, it's crazy. The London police chief said that Americans in London who might say the wrong things online are open to prosecution. That's how crazy it is right now. I, this is grounds for a second revolutionary war. <laughs> Get the muskets, of Benjamin. Ex- this is, this is why we fought. <laughs> this, it's time to yeah. bring back freedom. <laughs> we need to establish democracy. <laughs> yeah, we go there this time. I just love all the memes on Twitter, though, of like you know from Clint Russell and and similar accounts saying like, I'm I'm not going to stand for this. Like this is ridiculous. We should fight over this. Like I'm I'm anti-war, but this is grounds for a fight. <laughs> it's just, it, oh my. Everything about it is just crazy. Like I, it, it, you forget how other countries' uh, speech laws actually are when, because we're the only country, us in Japan, but we we kind of forced them to have it. Uh, we're the only country with a First Amendment bill of like Bill of Rights, freedom of speech law. Everybody else is just completely we'll restricted. Again. <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of forgot I had that one. Had to play it. It's a little. Late, well, you're, but you're right. I mean, it's it, as an American. There's very few things I'm I'm very much like. Oh yeah, we're better than you, right? Like like <laughs> like because you know I try to have a realistic expectation of what what it's really like to live in other countries. But this is one of the ones where I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry, we're just better than you guys on this. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was like, I, I could not imagine I being a Euro. Imagine. <laughs> I cannot imagine. What do you so think of uh, Shane Gillis' stand up where he's like, "This is your fucking country, dude." <laughs> 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 that was a good Shane Gillis. That was a good one. Uh, what so would, the, what well, would the mechanism even look like for a for Britain to extradite an American for saying something hateful on Twitter from America? Like, what would that even, how, how yeah, could that possibly It is funny that he did say extradite, that we're going to try to talk to the U.S. <laughs> yeah. government. It's like, hey, could you send that person here for their memes? And the U.S. <laughs> State Department's like, oh, yeah, I guess we got to call the Pennsylvania police and get this person arrested because like, yeah. London asked us to. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, right. the, consta- the constable yeah, called and right. he, he wants to <laughs> this put guy you in the stockade. does not know what's going on. Uh, so anyways, uh, we can, we can review It's one minute long. This is the, the London police chief, uh, making this quote. Cause we got it. We, it's hard to believe this happened. So you have to watch it. You have to watch this dude say it. We will throw the false force of the law at people. And whether you're in this country committing crimes on the streets or committing crimes from further afield online, we will come after you. Talk to me about that because we have seen some high profile figures whipping up the hatred you talked about it in there with the officers in fact about this being added to by online commentary i mean i'm even thinking of the likes of elon musk getting involved what are you considering when it comes to dealing with people who are whipping up this kind of behavior from behind a keyboard and maybe in a different country being a keyboard warrior does not make you safe from the law you can be guilty of offenses of of incitement of stirring up racial hatred there are numerous terrorist offences regarding um, uh, uh, the sort of publishing of material. All of those offences are in play if people are provoking hatred and violence on the streets. And we will come after those individuals just as we will physically confront on the streets the thugs and the obs who are taking, who are causing the problems for communities. It's funny to see the reversal of keyboard warrior now too. Yeah. So the in- implication of that is that. The, they're going to go to the U.S. State Department and be like, hey, Elon Musk said naughty things. And they're going to be like, oh, okay, let me call Texas and get Texas to arrest Elon. <laughs> what, wasn't it in the U.S.? To, to which Texas goes, go fuck yourself, all right? <laughs> <laughs> On point with the accents. I was three for three. Uh, wasn't it in the U.K. where Count Dankula got 
yeah uh, got in prison for, for teaching his girlfriend's dog to do a sig aisle <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pug too and it's just over there just like doing this little thing yeah but insane. that was back in like 2016 2017 yeah, time yeah. frame too yeah. so the How crazy thing to me though here be the crazy thing to me here though is that he's out people now. that oh, are yeah. cool. he's back on twitter sorry i, I want to bring this back because i i'm i'm shocked by the fact that the people that are in the streets that are supposedly supposedly inciting hatred against immigrants are really just responding to the stimulus of what's happening in their own communities with this influx of, of people who are, you know, either just taking up resources or, you know, consuming, you know, housing and things that they feel like they deserve and they need, and they're not getting from their government. You know, they're just out there saying, Hey, like you're, you're treating us like we don't even exist here. And we're upset about that. And then the police are sicked on the people who are saying, hey, we have problems with our government instead of being sent to address the problems that are occurring in their communities. And there's a couple of things simultaneously. And we talked about this when you weren't here last time was there is certain times where we assess things systematically. We say, what is the voice of the unheard in this situation? Right. That was the narrative that many on the left and many across the middle had about Black Lives Matter. In fact, uh, Prime Minister of the UK put out you know, that kind of rhetoric at the time. And now that it's the voice of the unheard of the English person uh, from England, uh, regardless of race, about these migrants, all of a sudden it's the individual that commits crimes or committing crimes. And obviously both are true. The The person who uh, commits arson in a local pub or busts down a window uh, to steal stuff at, you know, during in a riot, just because it's done in the name of, you know, this social issue, that person isn't legitimated just like they were in BLM. But that doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate people who have legitimate grievances they're trying to protest. For sure. Uh, additionally to that, there, there's a non-trivial and probably the best evidence we reviewed last time of agent provocateurs Yeah. in this situation. So I, I it is, uh, it's an error to go too far either way on that one, yeah. in my opinion. Like, you have to hold the individual accountable. This is the, the uh, mental model of individualism and injustice. The individual, you want to, you, the, the closer you are to justice, the closer you are to an individual who commits an individual crime. So the individual who burns down a place is a bad guy, yeah. right? But all the people around him that weren't there to burn something down, but rather there to protest the stabbing of children in a, in a, in a social structure that they feel like is unfair, that is legitimate. We shouldn't, and we don't, we don't want to fall into the media trap of, of painting all those people with the same brush as well, to he, what they're doing. But, and the, and the problem here though, and, and forgive me if, uh, stop me if, if I'm rehashing things from last week, cause no, I fine. wasn't here, but did you guys address the, the like bands of, uh, Islamist, like, like thugs basically running around beating people up? Yeah. And the, that's, that's UK? also, that's also like the, uh, what, what do we call it? Two tier policing problem. Right. Right. Which is goes both ways, right? The, the two tier policing problem as reported by the guardians about how blacks and migrants are, dis are discriminated against by the police, but that's not at all what we see in these protests. I mean, we see they're not stopping anything to do with them. Well, right? it's, it's good. It's a complicated story. Some, there's some clips that suggest that they're running around completely free of police presence. And the other ones that there are police confrontations with Muslims. Sure. So these are, these are both things happening. There are peaceful protests that are happening, you know, by native English that is completely peaceful and they're like candlelit visuals and those are real. Uh, but there's also Muslim gangs running around and we actually found a clip. We didn't actually play it, but of a police officer walking up to this group with a translator saying, Hey, if you have weapons, leave them at the mosque. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're, they're arresting old British ladies, right. You know, for being too close to a riot. And to your point about a pacemaker. Yeah. Yeah. We played that clip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and to your point about, um, you know, about justice being as close to the individual as possible by not addressing by the police, not addressing the, bands of thugs who are running around beating people up they're creating a sense of resentment and animosity amongst the native populations of britain who are seeing that happen and then extrapolating the failure to prosecute those individuals across the entire swath of immigrants right. total right. creating a collectivist resentment and a problem mm -hmm. you know getting further and further away from actual justice being served so like the cops are in this instance, I feel like perpetuating the problem yeah. of this like migrant hate situation that's going on. Right. And there's, and there's certain lines that they are crossing on the ground that are illegal in Britain, which would be probably perfectly legal in America. Right. So for example, going in front of an, an immigration center to protest outside the immigration, that's just illegal. You just can't do that. Apparently uh, that's, hmm. that's how this seems to be enforcing this. And so just by doing that, they're saying that's inciting racial hatred. And therefore in the minds of people like that, it, that legitimates 
the mobs of Muslim men wandering around with weapons, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's how they see it. They see that's the initiation of violence, and that's not at all yeah. how I would see it. It seems to me, if okay, and then it's obviously very different if you're going around just beating up any Asian or Muslim man, right? That would also be bad. And that's there are videos of that as well, of just dudes just walking up and sucker punching people who just happen to be brown yeah, um, in the wrong place, wrong time. Right. So that I, I, it's a complicated situation made worse by collectivism, yeah. right? And made worse by a policy and, and, and made worse by the people at hand. Luton, for example, voted overwhelmingly for the party of the current prime minister. And they're the people who had the biggest gripe about this phenomena, right? Uh, I, we brought it up, but we didn't get to talk about it much last time. But it's it's a it's it's so weird. It's like people voting for Democrats in America and then being surprised when they're pro socialism. Yeah, right. I mean, like, what do you what do you expect? You voted for labor, right? Yeah. Like, what do you, yeah. That's, so that's the definition of insanity, right? Yeah, yeah, right. So there's a little bit of self ownership there too, as a group. But once again, that's not a that's not a good measure because of that problem. Uh, let's get let's get into the uh, the conversation between Elon and Donald, the Donald. Yes. That the EU is trying to censor because Donald might be saying hateful things, hateful things, yes. and whatnot. So if he's president, can they try to? Get him arrested? Get God no. <laughs> Dude, well, just, we, we would like to extradite your yeah. uh, your criminal there. What, what is interesting about that too is the degree to which there was silence from the U.S. government about the London police chief threatening a specific American oh, with yeah. legal yeah. consequence, right? Yeah. I mean, like the State Department should be saying no. You know, like that would be. I mean, to me, it's like the role good luck. of the government. Like good luck. Yeah. Like bring it on. I guess. Like <laughs> just try it and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this conversation happened on Monday night, and uh, it started 45 minutes late, which everybody was super upset about, but apparently there was a DDoS attack, denial of service, uh, direct denial of service, which is a common, like, you kind of, like, overflow the system, yada, yada, yada. There was a point in time where the Twitter spaces could only hold, like, 100,000 people, and everybody, it it was kind of fun on Twitter at the time, because it was kind of, like, kind of developed the, the timeline into a bunch of haves and haves nots where everybody's <laughs> just like, Oh, I, I can't believe, I can't believe all the people on the outside. You know, like, <laughs> everybody's like the, the music in here is awesome. You know? like, everybody's like, you're the digital bourgeoisie. <laughs> yeah, it was that. But then, but then over time, you know, they, they fixed up the problem and it got to the point where, uh, I think the highest number I saw was like 1.35 million people on it live. while the conversation was happening. Uh, the, the estimated viewer, like of people who have seen at least elements of the conversation is about a billion. That's crazy. And it was also one of those things where like every single major influencer live streamer was live streaming it on like Twitch, rumble, kick YouTube, et cetera. So it just was everywhere. Right. Um, like uh, the the current Twitter space is just the Twitter spaces itself, I think, has something like 40 million uh, people clicked the play button right wow. on it. But so massive conversation. And it wasn't even really an interview. It was just like a phone call between Donald Trump and Elon Musk. So right. and it was a very much. And that was Elon's goal going into it was it was this. uh I want to humanize the guy because when there's an adversarial, usually when somebody's in an adversarial interview, you don't really get them. Nobody's themselves in an adversarial interview, right? right? So this is just kind of a back and forth. We're talking. Elon's giving his opinions about things. Donald Trump's giving his opinions about things. And it went on for two hours. It actually kind of got to the point where the end, it was like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. It was kind of that. Uh, that's <laughs> it cute. was kind of like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no. So it, it was a crazy good. It was, it, and I thought it was good. I, I thought it was good from a messaging standpoint, from a political standpoint. It's another part of those things where, uh, Trump's been kind of ever since the assassination attempt, he's been doing more of these things that I think humanize him in a lot of people's eyes. There was like the Bryson golf video mm-hmm. and like, you know, all these stuff he's going on people's like, he's going on like young Gen Zers, uh, like, like live streams and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I think he's getting human humanized to the public, especially to like the young public. Cause like the boomer conservative voter is already voting for him. It's yeah. I these can, people, right? I can corroborate that. I've was reached out to by a couple of people who, said that very thing like it was interesting to hear him in long form i had only previously really heard sound bites or had only seen him in debates and er- you know arenas where he's like at a rally or something like that where he's not just just himself he's he's projecting something or he's arguing and and it, it 
changed my perception of kind of who he is or I realized I agreed with him more than I thought I did before. Mm -hmm. So I, I think more of these things are certainly going to be helpful for bringing the younger demographics around to seeing him in a different light than the media has ever portrayed. Also it. helps when they're like cracking jokes back and forth too. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, Oh, this is like, it's just like a, a grandpa cracking jokes, like a grandpa who's lived an interesting life telling stories, <laughs> cracking jokes. Right. Like that's, uh, I, yeah. I think another part of that is, is Donald was very, was very different, right? He wasn't, I'm going to own you press member. Who's talking to me. Mm -hmm. He was, you're someone I like. And, and you got the sense of this is how he would talk to someone he did like, right? He, he's complimenting Elon and all these different dimensions. To, actually to his detriment in some ways we will get into and being very conciliatory and cooperative with the whole conversation which is not what you get if he's talking to msnbc or cnn or something like that well yeah. and that's the thing about donald is like he's very respectful to people that give him respect yes right he's yeah. a, he's a there's the reciprocity of respect that he's mm -hmm. always had and he's somebody that's very impressed by impressive people like he really likes smart people mm -hmm. um and that's always been clear so when he's sitting there talking with elon he's just like like he has a certain reverence towards elon because elon does a lot of really cool things and and mm -hmm. trump likes people that do cool things right yeah. like yeah. that's always been kind of how he was right? you get the best rockets amazing rockets <laughs> i see the rockets go up and then they come down who would have ever thought of that what <laughs> one of my favorite quotes was <laughs> it was something like um uh I told I told uh, I told Putin that there'd be no way you'd go go like things like no way I said way <laughs> <laughs> yeah interesting uh, before we get into the clips we're going to play from it uh, what were your favorite moments from the conversation if you have any the the thing that sticks out I mean we'll get into a little bit is the Russia Ukraine thing where he actually demonstrates some knowledge like policy knowledge of depth around mm -hmm. NATO expansion from the Russian perspective and the strategic empathy there you know it's one thing to have somebody who's just generally pro-peace uh, and i think donald trump just is kind of has an inclination in that direction he has good instincts there it's another thing to actually know things and be able to articulate them and persuade people on that mm -hmm. and that, that was very encouraging to me yeah how about you kyle um I, I i think just generally what i said was the overall vibe of the thing mm -hmm. but, and also it's it's more so kind of what it did. Like it brought a large amount of people together talking about this thing and people had, and a lot of people kind of changed their minds around the man himself, not mm -hmm. necessarily about like policies and stuff like that. It was just like, it was a very interesting historical moment too, especially with when we're talking about new media and it was like, this was one of the most viewed interviews, quote unquote interviews of all time. Well, think yeah. about it. It's, it's a 10th of the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 125 million people watch the Super Bowl. A billion people saw this. Yeah, like that's a hundredth of them. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, to, to whatever capacity, you know. And, and it just, I, I think it shows a new way of what I'm excited about, especially like new Trump. Like the last month of what Trump's been doing in general with his media appearances is we're seeing the new wave of how politics I think should be done of especially reaching people that are like in the under 40 bracket mm -hmm. where he's going on a lot of these long form stuff, live streams, like live streams, not even just like recorded interviews. Like he's going on live streams and just being live. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And allowing and himself to be like right? off the cuff and Imagine exactly. more natural. Canada doing that? It's crazy. Like, crazy. like um, imagine Biden or Kamala doing this, like, you wouldn't get it or just like any standard politician. But I think we're moving into an environment where that's kind of what you have to do. Like yeah. we need yeah. more of the Vivek energy. We need more of the JD Vance is good at this stuff. He's been going on like live podcasts and things like that. too. I was going to ask right. how much, uh, when you were brought, brought up that he's like doing more of these, how much do you think Vivek is an influence in that? Or do you think Trump would have done that either way? I mean, I'm sure he's, he has people around him who are cluing him into who he should talk to, like Aiden Ross, for example, probably not somebody you would otherwise be familiar with, yeah. but going on with a guy who's getting one hundreds of the biggest of live views. streamers. Yeah. Like really, you know, an important one or, or, you know, um, very influential with black, Paul with young brothers. black men too, is Aiden Ross. Right. Totally. So like, I mean, really so strategic, demographic. really strategic for sure. I have to say before we get into the clips, my favorite moment was when Elon uh, expressed the the root cause of inflation because you know we, we always kind of we understand that at least i think the prevailing reason in trump's mind for inflation is um different or he like he thinks about a good economy and he thinks about interest rates i have to bring down interest rates mm -hmm. but for elon to just be there and be like you know 
monetary policy, like printing money creates inflation. Yeah. Like for him to just lay that out, not just for Trump, but for everyone who was listening, There's, it was just like so satisfying. I, I have that clip. Let's just go Let's right check into that out. clip. Will it work? It's, it's sticker it's, shock. They call it sticker yeah. shock, right? I, I think it really just comes, like I said, I think it just comes down to, to, to really, I guess to really to two things, which is, is that if, if you solve government overspending, you solve inflation, which improves living right. standards of the of the, the average person, and then and then if if you uh, deregulate, like have sensible regulations, so because a lot of the, re the regulations are nonsensical and and cause uh, the cost to be extreme for no reason, um, and the, the, but unless you've got effective deregulation, like Reagan did did a great job on deregulation in the eighties, but it's been forty years since we had an, at right. anyone really. I mean, during your administration, we, we made some progress, but I think uh, there's an opportunity to make, I think, radical progress with sensible regulation. Um, and, yeah. uh, and 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 if, if well, if, Elon, if, we if those two things, yeah, burning plants, and you know, so you sort of can't get away from it at this moment. I mean, someday you might be able to, but I do hear we have anywhere from a hundred to five hundred years left. Oh, he's you know, going into other stuff. Yeah, there. yeah. Uh, but Talk that, about that was actually one of my favorite moments that it cued in and reminded me is Elon basically asked Donald Trump for a job. <laughs> oh, on a yeah. like a government accountability. Yeah, he, he, wants efficiency, to have a, efficiency. he wants to have a committee or a board that is government uh, accountability that that specifically looks at old regulations and cuts old meaningless regulations that no longer matter. And like and, and also looks at it like how valuable is this to the taxpayer? And e Elon basically said, I'd be willing to head up that board. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Which, Elon Musk, Javier Malay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we just need the president of another country yeah. in the cabinet. Yeah. Well, and, and Donald Trump's response was like, oh, you would have so much fun with that board. I've seen the way that you just go into companies and you're like, cut, cut, cut. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Him and Vivek just tag teaming the shit out of regulations yeah. would be great. Uh, no, that, that was a good one. I, I think that might have been a slightly different different spot than when he basically said like monetary policy, you he know, said it creating, like creating yeah. money out of thin air creates inflation. Like I just love for that line to be repeated as much as possible to the average person because most people don't think that way. You know, they might think, oh, corporations are being greedy and whatever, especially on the left, they think that. But I, I love that. That's just, just get that more into the popular narrative around inflation and we're going to be better off. Well, mm -hmm. that's also the message that Biden was delivering about corporations them being greedy oh absolutely oh, that's, that's the leftist narrative that's always the leftist but it's also, narrative. but it's also the most uh instinctual to the average person right what they see is that prices are set by the person they're buying from so it's easiest to assume that therefore that person is just being greedy right? well and i actually or just price gouging as kamala as say, we were right. preparing to start the episode i was just noticing trending on twitter was uh was <laughs> don't be noticing <laughs> was uh kamala it was proposing uh food price controls yes too right yes. which which goes into the left of narrative left of narrative leftist narrative of why prices are going up just like oh these greedy companies they just you either pay higher prices or you starve you know <laughs> like, like that's the attitude yeah right as if as if money was just just a thing it mm -hmm. has no nature in itself it doesn't it isn't the medium of exchange it's just exists right right uh without a theory of money you can't really understand why all the prices are suddenly going up at the same time and this is always the this is always the challenge to that it's always the pushback and we'll get back into it Sorry, but I got an econ nerd for a moment. Why is everyone systematically more greedy at the same rate at the same time right now <laughs> than they were 10 years ago? They're just more greedy now than then. It's just greed increased. Yeah, they, they just, right. they, the, the, the greed, greed curve went up. The greed up. <laughs> index is up, you know, yeah, whatever. It's like community. Anyway, so, uh, and then we also had, uh, one of the things I was interested in, is Donald Trump said, I'm not going to talk about the assassination attempt anymore, but Elon just leaned right in that right off the bat. This is the first question. Because this is, this is why Elon supposedly uh, endorsed him, so. You, you can't fake bravery under such circumstances. The courage is instinctual or it is not. It's not a rehearsed action. And so I just want to say that uh, I think a lot of people admire your, your, your courage under fire there. And uh, um, yeah, so. Thank you very yeah. much. I, I appreciate it. I didn't, I, don't think, I didn't think of it. I just wanted to get up and I wanted to stand up. I wanted to let people know, you know, I felt I was good. When, when they were uh, on top of me, covering me actually, very much covering me and, and very bravely, but uh, I wanted to get up. I said, I want to get up. And uh, I want to get up. They wanted, <laughs> you know, they had, they have everything there. They have, uh, they wanted stretcher. I didn't like the stretcher. And I knew I was hit in the ear, but I knew I wasn't hit anywhere else. They felt I was hit someplace else because yeah. it was such a, a lot of blood. And they were sure that I was hit someplace else. And they were saying, sir, you, you, you were hitting more than the ear. I said, nope, I was hit in the ear. I want to get up. 
let me get up. And so we, I got up and the crowd didn't know what to think. I mean, this was so, so many people and they did, you could see they were confused. They didn't know what to think. And I wanted to let them know I was okay. It was very important for me to let yeah. them know that. And they went wild. You, you've seen the after. They didn't go wild when yeah. I got up because they didn't know, was I alive? You really couldn't tell. When I stood up before the hand, before the, you know, the fist in the air, uh, they didn't know if I was alive. Nobody did. And uh, when I put the fist up, they were they were just relieved and happy and thrilled and uh, the place went crazy it was pretty amazing yeah. it was a it was a terrible well, was, thing but it was, it was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly moving yeah yeah and i think a lot of people had that instinctual response to that and one of the real tragedies is that we are a month out and most people have forgotten about it it's so crazy that we just went to that and then we're like, yeah, and the Olympics, super gay, right? Like that's, <laughs> well, you, you, wow. You, you even had people who would traditionally not be on Trump's side, people like Mark Zuckerberg yeah. said in an interview, like, that was one of the most badass things I've ever seen yeah, <laughs> right? Right. with his new Zoomer haircut. <laughs> which which actually gives me pause because I, I'm curious if there's this narrative around Mark Zuckerberg at that point. I was like, is he maybe more based than we gave him credit for? Was he kind of just, you know, around a bunch of leftist liberal people in the tech world and that sort of like informed his views as he coming around he's going to ufc fights you know he's he trains uh mma competes. and and competes and so you know like is he trending back in the other direction does he now have a little bit more cover with the tech industry kind of leaning more towards the trump direction or do you think this is some sort of like pr stunt i think i think he's like a nerd his image i think he's a nerd that really just wants to do a bunch of vr and he has an activist wife with a foundation <laughs> i think that's what a lot of it is he's just sort of like yeah whatever <laughs> like i kind of think that's he's, just, he's just like a super nerd that wants to do things and he, he probably has like lefty views because he's silicon valley you know liberal i think you're just gonna be kind of naturally in that but you know and i don't think he's like you know like maga or something now like but i i think that there's I think there's a lot of that and a lot of those types of people kind of just fall into the milieu and then you have the people around them doing stuff with their with their thing while they're focusing on whatever they're doing. Like I think Dorsey was a similar way where he was like, you know, remember Dorsey also Dorsey tweeted out a link to a, Murray Rothbard's Anatomy of the State and he's like a big Bitcoin guy, mm -hmm. right? So like he has these libertarian tendencies, but in the moment you're everybody's just kind of like they're doing their thing and then they have their like little trust and safety commission under in the company that's doing that stuff and you have these managerial activists and things like that and they're not paying that much attention to all that stuff as the ceos like i think that's where a lot of that goes in yeah. so like is he just on the testosterone to libertarian pipeline right now? Well, and, and <laughs> yeah. Something to remember is Zuckerberg gave $400 million in the last election on like COVID relief and helping with like get out the vote efforts and things like that. Like right. he gave a lot of money. Right. For the drop boxes specifically, right? That's what kind of what it was used a lot for. Of a lot of rule changes and grant monies to mayors and things like that. To There's facilitate, to facilitate, uh, uh, absentee ballot voting, which which to normies doesn't mean you're a leftist. Right? right to normies, that just means you like democracy. What we know is that absentee ballot voting can increase the voting propensity of lower uh, propensity voters, right? Who tend to lean left. That wasn't true that also year. Lower information in many right? states, right? So Montana probably swung more to the right because when you dick lower into Montana's voter propensity, the more right winger there are. Sure. Right? But so that but, could be true in the Appalachia and other places. As but well. elections are often decided by urban environments and in six specific states, right? Yes, <laughs> like, sure. right? Which so like more get out the vote efforts in those for people that would not vote and are more low information. Those are going to be skewing leftwards, right? Correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Did you guys see? I feel like I saw that Zuckerberg said he's not going to be contributing to campaigns. He yeah, said it in that right, same yeah. interview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so maybe he is turning around. There you we'll go. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Well, it, who knows, right? Um, then the next, the next big thing in there was uh, Trump and Elon talking about Ukraine and Russia. So, and we have to not allow anything to happen with stupid people like Biden. You know, Biden uh, <laughs> got did got something it. with Russia. Actually, uh, be, was, before I go, before we go further, that's one of the funniest things when you see him in these off the cuff moments, like in these live streams is he just cannot help himself to just throw shade at somebody. <laughs> speaking of which, did you see the interview or that he was like speaking in front of some people talking about General Milley leaving a bunch of equipment in Afghanistan? He's like, sir, I think it's going to be cheaper to leave it behind, sir. And he's like, and that's when I knew 
this guy is a fucking idiot. <laughs> just like, this isn't a room of people. Like, what? <laughs> like there, there was a point in this interview where he's talking about just some governor. I can't remember even which governor it was. It was like mayor of, or governor of Illinois or something. And he's just like, man, he's such a piece of work. What a dumb guy that is. <laughs> just, yeah, and it just like, goes into continuing. He, can't even. <laughs> he just can't help himself. It's so funny. <sighs> No chance of him ever going in. And when I left, and then I, then after I left, they started forming big armies on their on the border with Ukraine, right? And I looked at that, and I thought he was doing that because Putin's a good negotiator. I thought he was doing that to negotiate. But then Biden started saying such stupid things. For instance, he said that uh, it can be a NATO country. Meaning now, Ukraine. Putin, Russia, for for as long as there's been NATO, has said we're never going to agree to that. And we go right up front and say that. And we did things and said things through this president with a low IQ, very low IQ. He had a low Cast IQ 30 years IQ. ago, by the way, but now he might not even have the <laughs> IQ at all. There is no, there's nothing on the board that goes this low. He said things that were so stupid that that, that war would have been, that war had zero chance of happening if I were there, zero chance. He was saying yeah. everything yeah. the opposite. Everything the opposite. And it's so sad because many more people have been killed in Ukraine than you read about. You don't read about how bloody it is and how does sure. Hey, look, just in the two armies, you lost a half a million people. But if you think about it, uh, Russia's gone, you know, Russia defeated Germany with us and they defeated Napoleon. You know, they've been around a long time. They're a big fighting force. Yeah, sure. And it's very unfair. And Ukraine now doesn't have enough men they're now using young men and very old men to fight. And it's it, we're in a very bad position. And I'm not going to blame exclusively, but I can tell you I could have stopped that. And a smart president could have stopped that. It wouldn't have happened. Looking at the risk of... And, and this is where they get into uh, nuclear warfare. And it was really cool to watch them talk about like hey this is a real threat that exists today it's something that trump's very scared of nuclear war and that's like it's, it was very evident in this and as the, everyone should be well, <laughs> right, right but what's scary is how many people aren't specifically people in the state department you know and yeah. who are surrounding kamala who seem very laissez-faire about it in fact there's a whole internet narrative things like it's actually not that bad you know it's actually been overblown actually i'm gonna well actually smart my way into thinking about how nuclear gamesmanship is actually a really great idea uh, and this is a thing that's happening all over. Uh, I, I think there is a substantial, one of the best things about Trump is his sensitivity to that problem. Mm -hmm. If if one of your issues is foreign policy, right? If you care about <laughs> the future of the world, uh, uh, the, the, the tension there could not be greater between him and his opponent. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, uh, YouTube actually fed me a compilation of Trump over the years from like the time back in like the seventies. And it was like things that he had said over time. And something that I noticed in that compilation was how generally anti-war Trump has been his entire life. Like mm. he, he's, he's very much, and e even back when we're talking about post nine 11, like in the 2001 moment, he's just like, yeah, we got to hit the people that did us, did, did this to us. But all like already in 2003, when Afghanistan was starting, uh, he was very much against it and was calling Bush an idiot in 2003. Yeah. Right. Mm. And, and it isn't that we're saying that he's the perfect you know, anti-war president or anti-war candidate or whatever. What we're saying is generally His he's had a better inclination here than many people from the blob. Well, uh, and I'm way more worried about how the blob thinks of this than I am with a, someone with a general inclination to say, Hey, thermonuclear war would be terrible. You know, well, yeah. my, my, my instinct with Trump is that his attitude is just like he doesn't like all the killing. He, he thinks that some of it's necessary sometimes like he's a, he's a realist about that. Like, I think that's actually kind of realistic, but he just wants America to be this like cool, prosperous place where like people can like like go to casinos and build cool things and like like that seems to be just like his mental model of how america should be is right. just like let's not involve ourselves with that let's just let's just be awesome like, he's right. way more like the sims than age of empires yeah. 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 that's exactly yeah. that's well exactly done. right yeah. 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 Look, i used to play video games yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. i just grew up at a certain point so hey. i don't need more ouch <laughs> throwing shade so the corporate press of course You're full of shit today <laughs> The corporate press reacted to this with, can you believe 
this thing happened and it's it's very telling watching how they talked about it i mean yeah. you got the headline analysis and you want to you want to click on that copy? yeah my my boy at autism capital <laughs> <laughs> uh trump rambles and slurs his way through yeah. elon musk's interview usa today um, unmitigated disaster mm. oh yeah this was a big thing uh from newsweek uh donald trump's lisp during elon musk interview raises questions what? so okay so, uh, so i think depending on the platform like like what app you were using for the thing. Like, I think if you were like an Android user or something like that, the compression on Trump's audio was a bit off. Mm. Uh, and it made people think that he, like I had people text me. It's like, does Trump have a lisp? And I, I, res- and I responded specifically, no, he's just from New York. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently people that were Android users who were also the people with the most problems getting on. Mm. Like most people I knew with iPhones were getting on fine, but like people with Android users or on desktop were having trouble getting into it when the DDoS attack was happening. So there might be something that was happening there on the tech side. Yeah. Uh, I had somebody reach out to me uh, who was actually like a former audio professional saying like, I just found out that Trump has a lisp and I was like, what? (laughs) And and I tuned in and on an iPhone and I heard what he was hearing Mm -hmm. Um, but to me, it sounded very much like audio artifacts, like compression exactly. issues. Mm-hmm. The high end gets rolled off a little bit. So you don't hear the sibilance that you would hear. And it's more of like a soft S and it sounds like hmm. you have a lisp, but I, I, I mean, when, when have else have you heard him speak with any shadow of a lisp? No. Yeah. Well, Does he just hide it that's really the well? thing yeah. to the point where Donald Trump tweeted out. Cause now he's like tweeting out on Twitter again, uh, on X. Yeah. Sorry. Dead name. Don't dead name. X. I, I dead named it. <laughs> um, the, uh, where he, like his side of the audio and it was completely fine. Right. Oh yeah. So, of course. So, but that, that became one of the things where he's getting hit on. Uh, he silly ridiculous. It doesn't matter either. It's like, okay, so what if he does? Elon, Elon Musk throws a Trump I rally. I thought that was a uh, very, it's from the Atlantic, right? So it's telling about who's yeah. saying that. The New York times says Trump regales Elon Musk with familiar falsehoods. Yeah. Uh, CNN fact check. Trump made at least 20 false claims in his conversation with Elon Musk. <laughs> um, Oh my God, Donald Trump and Elon Musk, a tale of two struggling social media entrepreneurs. <laughs> two struggling <laughs> coming from financial times. Wow. Is, oh, that, wow. is that meant to be ironic? I maybe it's very strange Hopefully. for the financial times to lean that high, hard into the irony. We have I, to hope. I, I know. I, I think that's, I think financial times is being very legit with that. Headline. <laughs> I, I don't think that's like an ironic headline huh. from them. Trump I, returns I not to trust X with times. technical glitches, softball questions from Musk. <laughs> Donald Trump and Elon Musk's X conversation took forever to start and then never ended. <laughs> <laughs> no, you hang up. No, you hang yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. So, and then we have the analysis from CNN uh, on our next clip and it, it, it kind of, it's somewhat telling. We just kind of go through, we could pause as we go or, or whatever uh, to kind of show this is how it was covered by the mainstream press experts to break all of this down uh, and Lauren uh, Tomlinson uh, let me start with you was it, mis- was it a mistake for Trump to do this conversation with Elon Musk I think the biggest problem with Donald Trump is the length of time he devotes to some of these interviews. I agree with uh, what the reporting was just saying that it's really important that you go reach voters where they are. And frankly, they're not on cable news anymore. They're on these streaming platforms. They're on the podcast. They're on uh, some of these other channels. And it's important to diversify how you're reaching the masses. But he lets them go on too long and then he diverges off message. Two hours is much too long for any sort of interview to go. Can we pause? Um, And I think that's the discipline. I disagree with that. Okay, why? why? Why would she think that? I mean, like, that is the new media format. That's podcast. That's every st- stay on message. Stay on message. That's what the political professional class will tell you. What are the yeah. top two most best performing podcasts right now? Isn't it like Rogan, Tucker and Rogan? Probably, yeah. And they're both multiple hours. Many hours. Well, and the other thing, too, and is this like, one? How, <laughs> yes. how is anyone still expecting trump to stay on any message whatsoever <laughs> right like hasn't haven't we just thrown that out the window yeah like, we, he just we, says we have he seen wants. him since 2016 <laughs> yeah, like, we know better than to well, expect he does that. two hour rallies right yeah <laughs> like, yeah so so the what she is giving is the standard communications professional advice which is make sure that you have a tight message that can't be used against you because their belief and this there is some evidence for this that if you do too much, you open yourself up to attack, right? Sure. Think about unboxing. You don't stand so that you can easily be hit. You cover, mm-hmm. right? So that you can throw shots without receiving shots. So when you're in that situation, 
what they see it as is by being on message, you can throw shots, you can advance your agenda with as small a profile to be hit back as possible. That's why you want short, cultivated, pre-worked out interviews, right? You want the Hillary Clinton treatment. You want somebody who likes you, who knows, you already know the questions and they give you exactly the things so you can knock it out of the park. Yeah. That's what they see as success. What's but wrong with to that? counter that? Yes. There are they already do that with short form stuff anyways. <laughs> they already they already twist it all. They already like try to manipulate it. The, the media it doesn't matter if it's long form or short form. They're already doing it. So like the 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 negatives that the professional c- communicator class will say about why he needs to say in short form stuff is like it's it's it doesn't matter. They do it anyways. Right. right. And, and and if you, it depends on what you think your major problem is. If your major problem is that people don't see you as a relatable person, then long form is the best thing you can do to come across as a relatable person. If right. you do short form, Which you're always going to look like a robot as an empty suit, as someone who's trying to sell something as opposed to a casual conversation that you can get into long form. Which is why people love his rallies and whatnot, because he goes on and he goes off the cuff all the time and you get to see like a little bit of him. You get to see him cracking jokes. His fans get to feel like they see a sense of the real him. Mm-hmm. And now things like long form podcasts and these types of conversations are just like another avenue for that. Um, and that's also what people like about Trump is they're like, you know, he might be an asshole, but he's an authentic asshole. Like that's the way that people view him. Right. And and they like that kind of that bully mentality that he can have where he does throw those jabs. And, uh, and it's not just all like, Oh, I'm so sick of the scripted political, like politician nonsense where it's just like, okay, we're going to hear that. Okay. Okay. Like people are done with that. And that's what people go to Trump for. Right. Mm -hmm. In comparison to Kamala's scripted stuff or, or, you know, any of, you know, or Nikki Haley or whatever. Right. Well, and that, and that draws a sharp contrast with the, very, very small number of appearances that Kamala has even done to this point. Uh, you know, least of which any off the cuff. I mean, I think that the Dems know that they can't let her off of that <laughs> leash lest they open themselves up to some very serious uh, scrutiny. But, you know, I, I do think, I do think you're exactly right, Kyle. I mean, getting into these formats that are open, that can't be manipulated and by nature, like really aren't that way because they're live, because they're, they're streamed to hundreds of millions of people. It, it gives him an opportunity to say what he needs to say without being manipulated by the mainstream press. Now all they have to go on is the commentary of the event, which far fewer people are going to ever be paying attention to than we're actually tuned into the, to the main, the main event. Itself. Well, and yeah, that's the thing is so many people, one of the things, the politically engaged people exist on Twitter and they're seeing everything. The hard, the hard stuff here though too, and this, it wouldn't matter if it was long form or short form, is the politically unengaged are getting their news from things like, which is it's so weird that like the politically unengaged are getting their news from CNN, right? <laughs> yeah. From political news. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. But I mean, is, it makes sense. <laughs> well, but, but it does make sense because it's like, it's an aggregator, right? Yeah. Like you can, you can hear about a two hour event in, you know, 90 seconds. And that's all you want to know. And for probably for most people who don't care to engage with Trump, all they're here for are the one liners about how shitty he is. Right. I mean, to be fair, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a Democrat, you don't care if he, if it was actually a good interview, you you would rather it not be a good interview. So you just want to hear about the worst parts. So uh, this program that we're watching averages 658,000 daily viewers. Daily, daily. So this right. most segment, of that is airports and most and, and return viewers. <laughs> yeah, true. Right. So I mean, and, and like bars and stuff like that where CNN is just playing. So consider for a moment that you have most of it's muted. <laughs> one million <laughs> you didn't put the captions on. Like, uh, yeah, one million on a two-hour podcast. You know, with with Elon Musk, a billion over after afterwards after all the restreams, all the other things, all the potential ones. I mean, you could you could set it anywhere if it's even from hundreds of millions to a billion. You're still orders of magnitude larger. So why wouldn't you? I think the Republic, it's just, it's just too narrow of a dogmatic view about good comps work. Now, would it be better if Trump could come across as a tight message speaker while doing long form? A good example of that is Vivek Ramaswamy, who can do that and comes across really well in all those formats. 
yeah, sure. But that's not who he is. And right. actually, part of his charm is is him saying, mm-hmm. Biden has a low IQ. He had a low <laughs> IQ doesn't even 30. have an IQ anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> he used to have a low IQ. Now he doesn't. Now it's like below the charts. <laughs> well, which, there's a dark underbelly to that statement. Like, we haven't seen Biden in how long now? Like, do we even know? We don't have a president right now. If he's alive? Like, we have a, we have a shadow cabinet, and that's what we have you Guys, right now. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he can't run for president, but he can be president. I don't know if you know this, obviously. Well, things are escalating. <laughs> Look, He's around just, the world he's, right he's in the situation room at all times just focusing on the business right he, that's why he's not doing press conferences that's why he's not out he's just he's he's at work well and he, here's actually the thing to bring up to kamala too is right now we we've just all kind of accepted that we don't have a president right now and that we just have the shadow government that's happening like we've all understood that for a long period of time but i think the american public is realizing that now where who's president like Biden's clearly not functioning. He had to drop out of the race, right? But, and I, I think people have this honeymoon period with Kamala. It was like, oh my God, now we're going to get somebody in. Like, we're going to have Democrats like that. No, Kamala is also not like if she was to be elected president, she's not the real president. <laughs> like the shadow right. cabinet is still there. Yeah. Right. Like she's completely, nobody's voted for her, right? Like she is the pick to be the puppet now because the old puppet is no longer able to like, literally the, old. The, 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 <laughs> the weekend at Bernie's moment is kind of like, Oh, we can't, we can't run that gimmick anymore. You know? So they have to move on to the next thing. She's never received any vote for public off not for not for public office, but for the presidency at all. Yeah. And she's just going to be moved in there and be controlled in the same way that Biden was controlled, right? And I, I think we all understand that. Like anybody that's politically engaged gets that. For but, sure. But people that aren't are like, oh, okay, finally we can replace the old man now. Like, like yeah. that's just where they're at. So to give the devil its due, the Republican comm strategist, that there is a story that came out of this that is somewhat damaging to Trump from this point, point of view. The United Auto Workers is now suing Trump and Elon because of their comments said on the podcast. Specifically, where Trump praises Elon over firing people who are trying to organize a union. Oh. And that's a violation of the National Labor Relations Board, uh, like rules around this sort of thing, uh, for even praising it. Second fact, not just doing it, but praising the fact that it happened. Um, and as a result, the United Auto Workers, a union, middle class, white majority, uh, population that is somewhat important to the Trump campaign has now endorsed Kamala, right? right? So they would see that as a, this is what happens when you go off script and you're not tight with your messaging question though. Two questions. Uh, one, that lawsuit is, does that, I mean, is that like constitutional? I feel like that has a pretty open challenge on a, on first amendment grounds. Is there something there for them to be like, well, he can say what he wants to say. There's no way that that can be illegal. Yeah. I th- I think it's, I don't know how that would work legally. I'm, that's a good question. I got to do a lot more research to know that. But what I would suggest is that it's less so about the lawsuit being damaging. It's more so about the lawsuit compared with the, the endorsement, the endorsement right. and the rhetoric around that specifically when you brought in JD Vance specifically because you could then try to cultivate a right. white middle-class working larger majority. Right. And, and I guess that, that was my follow-up question is, do you think that, you know, damage can cr- control can be done by JD Vance on this issue and do you think that while yes it's it's a bit damaging it's more the leadership of the UAW that is executing this endorsement versus the actual attitudes of its membership yeah and the membership is 400,000 auto workers yeah and 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 it's and it's also seen as like a cultural pillar of the white middle working class sure right so the the cultivating of that, I mean, Donald Trump already does well with that demographic and J.D. Vance is like a part of that. And the Republicans effort to cultivate union vote is an important part of their strategy going forward to try to build a better majority that's actually more reliable. United Auto Workers, were they ever really on that side? I mean, there's a big difference between UAW and their history with like the Boilermakers or the Teamsters and stuff like that. Yeah. Which, They're different unions and we shouldn't treat them as a monolith. Yeah. That said, it's part of their goal and this is not a good sign in that direction. Yeah. Which, and the teams, the Teamsters haven't made any endorsement yet either. It even says it in that article. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam actually asked this in the discord and I didn't know the answer to it. Um, everybody keeps saying that JD Vance like really helps with the, uh, with like the union vote and all of that and just kind of like labor in general. Um, why like 
Why? What, what are his actual <laughs> connections to that? Because he's he's okay. like a because he's like a you know he's like a venture a capitalist guy, yeah. type type of guy. It's, right? it's two things. One, it's uh, hillbillyology. It's just elegy. the book. <laughs> it's was that. It's like what he meant as a cultural figure when when he dropped the book. He is Ohio. Dude. Ohio. His votes in the mm-hmm. as a senator have been very friendly to union. Uh, his trade policy is a union friendly trade policy, right? He's a protectionist. He's an industrial planner who wants to maximize union worker uh, in, you know, in manufacturing, which is dominated by universe. One of the reasons why we struggle making things. Um, the, that effort goes way beyond JD Vance, but he's kind of become like a focal point of it for a bunch of reasons. And for, that's why for Republicans courting that vote. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it has less to do with his biography because you're yeah, right. The biography makes no sense. Uh, that said, it's 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 who he tells as a story around his public policy that matters. That is actually the attack that's being made on J.D. Vance. Um, I think Tim Walls did it in mm-hmm. his attacks in the speech was uh, what he was saying something along the lines of J.D. Vance does not represent you. He ran away from you and then wrote a book bashing you. Right. So like he ran to the Silicon Valley tech elite and started his you know, the tech billionaires. Cause everybody's just like Peter Thiel, Peter, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. And then he wrote a book bashing the commu- bashing where he came from. So it's like, he rejected you. Like that's the message. That's that they're what they're trying to do now. to try to drive that. And, and mm-hmm. that's, that seems like bullshit. Like, I don't think Hillbilly LG it actually does that. What it does is actually honestly engages with it and doesn't say that the government's the problem and the solution to all these things. And that's where Walsh actually diverts is well obviously anybody that says government intervention is not the solution to it is abandoning their roots <laughs> exactly. like, I, I think exactly. that's the the view that's what defines the white middle working class trust me is their reliance on government that's what they really like <laughs> idiot <laughs> all right so okay so <laughs> one of the things there it was interesting talking about the assassination attempt and I, there was some interesting poem that came out this week about the day specifically from the daily mail uh, one in five voters believe the FBI was behind the assassination. One third of Republicans do. That's a crazy number. So one in five voters and a third of Republicans believe the FBI was behind the assassination of Trump and Donald Trump. And this is interesting because obviously the Daily Mail article is all about like, look how silly these people are. I can't believe how silly they are. When obviously substantial questions remain and we've kind of moved past it in such a way as a, as a politic that it kind of begs a lot of questions. We still don't have an adult picture of the shooter. We have no explanation of the shooter's like motive. And we have no explanation of the drone flying. How did they fly the drone, bro? Joe, how did he fly a drone at a freaking event where the president was going to be? It makes no sense at all. I mean, it's very common to have restricted airspace where your drone won't even leave the ground. And for a presidential rally to not be restricted airspace is, well, it's... Probably, don't probably, be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. probably more than just a, a failure to, uh, you know, draw the lines and what's and the phrase okay. again, Kyle? Sophisticated incompetence. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how how to get there from people's baseline expectation of the media is reporting it's a lone gunman. If you don't believe that, you're some kind of suspect person yourself. Uh, to well, the FBI is doing it, right? I don't know why it's the FBI specifically that that makes I, I, sense. I think it's just heuristic. I, I I think people in their mind they think Symbol. they think the Intel boys in general, and it's yeah. just a heuristic. Like where in that everybody is going to have conversations, but I think the most important thing is just like people have this heuristic in your in their head that it is likely the Intel boys in some capacity did this. Yeah, right. And Newsweek, not long after, also purported one third of Biden supporters, not necessarily Democrats, but also moderates and Republicans. Republicans who support Biden, whatever, think Trump, the Trump shooting might have been staged, which is sort of the opposite claim. Yes. It wasn't an inside job. It was, it was fake blood. It, he never actually got shot. Imagine for a moment, like, and they, the, people are treating them like these are equally plausible terms. Right? Well, well, remember, <laughs> like, like, like re- remember the week, way harder to prove, right? Re- remember the week of the assassination attempt. Uh, we played that video of the guy on, um, I think it was like Venice beach or something yeah. where he was going around asking people. And yeah. that was a very, that was like the day after when mm-hmm. that video happened and everybody that hated Trump was like, all like, Oh, it was probably staged. It was probably yeah. staged, probably staged. That was the initial impression, right? Which like, but that doesn't like you, you're not applying any rigor to that ass- assertion at all. It's just right? instinctual. Yeah. And yeah. just a little bit of digging into like, well, how would that have been done? And like, what are the risks associated with, something like that and what is the cost benefit to the trump 
campaign of of faking something like this what are the you know it, it just it falls apart huh. pretty quickly well, I, I feel like if trump would fake did fake it he would be talking about it a lot more than he actually is right Fair. now and he wouldn't be As trying to like because like that, that's a that's a high risk move to like i'm gonna go down on the ground with all these secret service agents around me and pepper some blood on me <laughs> yeah, like. yeah or the least the least plausible option is that they they counted on a sniper to just barely graze him with a bullet <laughs> like, which is uh, it's insane, which, which it's is, insane. that would be crazy yeah, like, that would just be yeah purely insane so uh anyways i thought that was an interesting you know it's an interesting part of the polarization question that we're in the information environment we're in and how to think about these sorts of things if you see those as weighing the same i think you've you've really misunderstood what we mean by conspiracy what we mean by that there's a deep state what we mean by the potential of abuse of government actors to try to control the dialogue right and try to control who's in office and things like that you've you've really you've jumped a shark you've kind of put yourself into a, a very compromised position i mean it's not it's QAnon level conspiracy thinking right where you really have very little things to go on you're really just in reacting instinctually to a set of phenomena that doesn't fit your books and so you generate a narrative and then you're willing to stick with it to the degree that you're actually willing to say it on live television and to be clear you're, when you're saying these things weigh the same you're saying that there's the same likelihood that uh, the trump shooting was staged as there is that the right. fbi was in some treating way it like it's the same phenomena and it's not right like to, to say there are serious huge holes and lots of things we should know by now and dialogue we should be having and aren't on one side is a completely rational response to what the facts are of what we know as opposed to it was staged because I don't like Donald Trump and I don't want anything good or I don't want anything that makes him look good be a real thing. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, a lot of people in their mind, like I, I would be curious on polling on how much of the American public uh, believes the Kennedy assassin assassination was domestic Intel boys. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'd be curious on that because I, I think over time, probably a majority of the public believes that. So it's not that crazy for a lot of the public to then turn their eyes on this event and look at it and be like, oh, okay. And then they just equate the two. I think it makes complete sense for that to happen. Also at the point right now where if we're talking about like deep state conspiracy, not only did we have a, an assassination attempt on the president, like a week later, there was a coup of the current president. <laughs> right? yeah. Like, yeah. Who, who, a lot of stuff has happened in the last week, in the last month. Right? Truly, truly. Um, to the point where it's like, as I was just ranting earlier, where we don't even have a president at this point. Like we have one in name, but we don't even really have a real president at this time. Yeah. Well, and I mean, this speaks to something that's a little bit deeper culturally. Like we, we notice that there's obviously a lot of like mental health issues in the world right now and in the United States. And there are assertions around this that like the, the, the acceleration of technology, of news, the access to so much information, having phones in our pockets, all this has sort of created that phenomenon. And the fact that it's accelerated so rapidly just in the last like month or two months, I think is probably also precipitating a lot of just like craziness around the world of news or in people's minds trying to make sense of what is actually happening in the world the fact that we've moved on so quickly from the trump too much shooting information to consume to, yeah like we skipped right over the the coup of biden and now kamala's in and now we're on to something completely different mm -hmm. you know the the olympics or whatever it's like people literally just can't keep up and process and comprehend and really make true sense of anything that's happening in the world at this pace mm -hmm. and, and i don't think that that's necessarily by accident i mean i think that the more you can just kind of flood people with stuff the more you can cover over the things that really matter yeah to ask answer your question and i think that's a really great point kyle um gallup has a poll over year to year going back to 1963 about the percentage of the american public that believe that it was a one person like a lone gunman that shot kennedy as opposed to someone else involved in uh, 1963 52 percent believed uh by 1975 it grew to 81 percent and then has been on a steady decline since then. That's kind of weird. Ish. Interesting. That's weird um, that it's been such a decline. I think the decline after the 2000s probably has to do with the silent generation dying off. Hmm. Who were adults at the time? Interesting. The boomers just got that just bought the propaganda. Uh, a little bit. I think, I think the boomers actually scroll back down. Statistically, uh, from reporting huh. that I also found from Reason, suggests that in general, older people tend to believe it, and younger people just aren't aware of the uh, the conspiracy. Interesting. So this has the uh, 
best guess here mafia and u.s government uh, and the cia lead the conspiracy list as far as who it was that people think was involved mm-hmm. other than the lone gunman mm-hmm. fidel castro coming in a, a distant fourth but if i think if you total <laughs> up the fbi hoover the secret service the cia the u.s government that that ends up to being mostly the government did the deep it. State, it would be the yeah. overwhelming majority yeah, I mean, couldn't you say those top three are basically all the same thing well yeah i mean um, organized ma- mafia no organized be. crime it's the government. Uh, well, well, we, we've trained you so well. Yeah. And one of the and it's it, it's difficult to underestimate the connections between the CIA and organized crime, specifically in this era of what we yeah. know about what the CIA was doing in collaboration with organized crime for assassinations, intel, uh, smuggling, uh, lots of stuff. But so, the Kennedy family yeah. also had a lot of uh, Italian mafia ties and and such, though too. Like there was a lot of that, and and uh, and just kind of screwing them over um through various things like there's a lot of history that exists there which is why the mafia uh gangster part of the theory was always a very prominent theory but then there is the question of like well there is often a, like a Venn diagram, you know, Kamal Harris loves Venn diagrams, <laughs> but there is a Venn diagram often of the Intel boys and organized crime. Like sure. that does often exist. There. And then we know that from public disclosure. That's not yeah. a conspiracy theory. That's a public disclosure. All right. So, uh, you also, this happened this week. Your social security numbers were hacked. Uh, this is an interesting story, uh, from the LA times and others, uh, a hacking group called the U S DOD, ironically, <laughs> uh, claims to have stolen approximately 2.7 to 2.9 billion records containing sensitive information, including social security numbers, names, addresses, dates of birth, and phone numbers. Uh, it was from a uh, data broker, right? You'll think this is interesting, Joe. Uh, National Public Data, which gathers data from all kinds of sources, matches up the data across these databases, and then sells that you know consumer profile to uh, private entities, political entities, et cetera, probably the NSA. Um, why like why does a data broker have my social security number? Why wouldn't they? <laughs> shouldn't that's that be, their job. <laughs> shouldn't that be some sort of sacred, you know, well kept government secret? Yeah, I, I'm it's so I'm very, important. I'm, very, I'm curious about their acquisition policies for that because usually you don't put your social security number into the sort of things that would be matched for that. Right, you put it into like banking or a- anything finances. You, yeah, you would put your social security. In. But once again, like, that's supposed to be speaking. that's supposed to be consumer to business there's not supposed to be a sell of that for if i understand no right. but like hackers like it just ev- your social security number can be a ch- can be gotten on the black market easily by anybody that anybody that wants to everybody's social security numbers are out there so this would suggest <laughs> you're suggesting that uh npd uh, acquired those by less than legal means i i, I don't know how they yeah. acquired it but like it's not to, to me it's almost less like yeah, of course everybody's social security numbers are out for any hackers to get. Like, just because I know how the internet works. Like, so many, like, financial institutions have been hacked in the past, and if mm. if your if your social security number was in that financial institution because you legally have to put it with that financial institution in order to do business with them, which is anybody, a bank, stock brokerage, whatever, um, very likely your social security number exists somewhere. Sure. Right? If, it's just, well, so... I guess two questions that I have is like one, like, should we be worried about this? Uh, yeah. Uh, so your credit score is really important, right? It's one of the most important things is a social a measurement score. for our society of your trustworthiness. Uh, your social security number is the only real way uh, beyond like historical data about where you've lived to identify you as a person right. in the United States. Um, so therefore, it, it could be very damaging identity theft and things like that are uh, it can you know can ruin people's lives so then what is there to be done about it at this point well i mean one of the things that they do recommend and, and this is you know uh, maybe a grift is paying services that do monitor your credit do monitor your identity make sure someone's not using it that's not you um, and those services do exist and they work. I've, I, I actually had my identity stolen from the hack of the PlayStation network way back in the day. And PlayStation, Sony gave me identity protection for like 10 years after mm. that. Uh, they just gave it to me and said, just in case. So never had the, anything come up. Is the U.S. government going to give us all identity protection software now? Well, this would be <laughs> MPD. MPD should be the one issuing this to all their consumers. But yeah. this is a lot of data on a lot of people. And it's not even clear how many Americans are actually exposure here. Okay, so this is me, like, and I know this kind of thing happens, but we just had CrowdStrike 
where like the entire <laughs> computer system of the world just went down. Oh, it's noticing over here. And now we have this <laughs> like noticing. leak of all these social security numbers. Mm -hmm. Are there connections here? Is this, is this something that are, are we noticing a, a pattern of like these catastrophic I mean, massive scale leaks and hacks? That to are to me, the, the massive pattern is that we are still on just this 20th century infrastructure when we need to move towards 21st century infrastructure and, of and all what is of that? our cyber stuff. Well, really think about it. Social security is a program for retirement that somewhere along the way we said, this is a great way to quantify and number all Americans. So we'll just use that it's, now. It's, it's a best way for the technocrats to be like, beep, 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 everybody's a number in the system. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, but which is, uh, so So this this is the, the, the obviously the, the criticism. We're using a technology from the 1940s to understand who people are and where they are. And we need to obviously have better systems for identity now that we have the internet. Yeah, right? but see the slippery slope I see this going down is this is a pathway straight to uh, some sort of digital blockchain database where everybody has a code, a barcode on your forehead, a chip in your arm, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like to me, this looks like, and this is my conspiracy hat on here, that this could be not necessarily a false flag, but just a crisis that is used sure. to usher in some much more nefarious, all consuming social credit score, tracking database, whatever. Well, well, well and that's the thing is we are, I, I think we are going to move in the 21st century to digital identification and the fight will be over what shape that takes. Is it a centralized uh, digital identification thing or is it a decentralized version where you actually own your own identity? And that will be where the battle is. And it's actually one of the things why I'm bullish on Trump in a sense uh, for the future of us, of, of us actually moving into 21st century infrastructure when it comes to the internet age. Uh, and especially with his kind of crypto ties and, and how much he's courting the crypto folks, because this is a thing that exists in the crypto space is the idea of DIDS, uh, decentralized identification, which is a, a way of you actually owning all of your data. And it'd be like, your, your biometric data, your, you know, like every type of data, your, your government state issued data, all that stuff. And then you being able to then kind of like give it in an encrypted way to like your employers and to your doctor and all this stuff where you, but you maintain control of it. Yeah. Right. In, I like in that, that sense where, where the technocrat like centralized control everybody from the top type of mentality will be like, well, we'll just put all those into government databases on a, on a, on our blockchain. Right. right like right, that's right. the difference. So like, it's not that putting it onto the, onto a blockchain is a problem. It's which blockchain right, and like, right. what is the, what is the actual technology? What is the tech? What is the, um, technology and the application layer of it? How does that look? It's right. not the blockchain itself. It's the application. Yeah. Right. Well, if you look at like Estonia, for example, they have all of these things stacked into a singular government ID, government ID service that works across all these different domains. You could go the Estonian route and, you know, it, they're not a dystopia. That said, a more decentralized version that does very similar things that is then recognized by the government as authentic is probably safer in the long run for you, your, your identity, uh, for identity theft, and then to get a comprehensive singular identity that then you can track over time. If you go from one doctor to the other doctor, your biometric data and your health history follows you rather than them having to call each other and fax things around. We're still sure. at the faxing era on that <laughs> level, right? So, Well, not always. There's like digital infrastructure that exists across doctor's offices where they can pass things around. Oh, yes. But a lot of that stuff is fairly new too. And like you don't like control how, it how long it took us to kind of get into that mode is well, and I don't we, disagree. We move so slow. I mean, of so. course at, at the large scale, you know, especially like in medical stuff, there's so much red tape. They got to be yeah. very careful about HIPAA and that sort of thing. And that makes sense to me. I, I'm interested in what you're saying though, Kyle, about the like decentralized ID system. And I think that there's like a corollary here to the way that social media could change if mm -hmm. if people yeah. owned their data. Like if we had the ability to, to issue micropayments, you know, on the scale of like a, a hundredth or a thousandth of a, of a penny, the, the whole model that social media operates on gets turned on its head. Instead of your data being the product that the social media platform sells to these data brokers in order to make money or sells to advertisers, if you own that stuff, then you can choose to sell it to people that you want to be advertised from, right? Or you have the ability to, you know, engage with content in a different way where you're not the product. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting thing that people should start to like wrap their minds around and start to engage in because it's going to be, this is going to be like probably a part of the, the sort of civil rights movement of the 21st century is like who owns 
your data because that is an extension of you. That's a part of self ownership, isn't it? And there's a well, there, and there's market opportunity in that at minimum. Even if it's not, you're not saying like my data is a human right, which I have quibbles with. Uh, you do have you know Brave Browser, for example, does exactly what you're talking about, right. right? Where they use BAT token in order to monetize attention and data more directly and with more voluntary consent. And I think that's sure. where the most amount of like moral ick comes from is like where you feel like you are kind of either forced into or unaware of what's really happening uh, when it comes to your own attention. Right. So when your attention is very specifically and voluntarily given, then you're feeling much more comfortable about it. Um, and, and I want to note that not all of this is social media data. I would suspect that most of this is commercial data, oh, sure. uh, meaning when you sign up for your membership at Costco, they sell what you sell you know, uh, what you buy, mm -hmm. uh, when you sign up for, uh, uh, Albertsons, things, stuff like that, magazine subscriptions, all that's public information that you can grab or sorry, purchase, uh, it's private information you can purchase. That's more accurate. Well, this is the idea of, um, Farcaster, um, for example, for example, on the social media side is Farcaster is kind of like this tech layer on the Ethereum chain that, uh, you can kind of, you can own all of your, social media following, you can own all that stuff, but then there's applications that come up on top of it where people use the Farcaster like network to create their social media applications where it's like, which ones like Warpcaster, all these things, mm -hmm. but then you just choose to like bring your far chat, Farcaster data into those social media applications, right? And so like, if one of those applications decided to ban you, for instance, you still have all that stuff and you just move on to a different platform. And it's like, well, it's their law. Like, okay, I'm just not gonna use that app. I'm gonna promote this app now, but I still have my, all, my entire following because the application is actually much more like your UI experience rather than the actual data underneath it. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Another one is like, there's like baseline infrastructures like Civic token and others that are kind of built specifically to solve that problem identity movement through through that and then uh if you look at everything to like metamask all works by having a singular identity if we can combine these things and then build the legal infrastructure so that it's recognized as government financial institutions as a sufficient protocol for understanding someone's identity and then we are able to tie it to a real person in some way yeah um that that is where it it will really matter for folks in securing this information going forward and then lastly there Social security is bankrupt and terrible. Like we should just get rid of that. We should we should have a major reform in social security, yeah. especially for young people who are worried about this because you're going to pay the biggest cost. P pay out for, the people that are owed their thing, and then and start to work social security on its way out. Like, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, everybody sure. should get what they're owed, right? Yeah, <laughs> That's right. the biggest problem. Because like, if you ever talk about social uh, social security with like boomers, they'll be like, I, I deserve my thing. And it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. Like, yeah, well, you so do I, get, okay. Yeah, I'm not saying you I shouldn't the same get, way, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't get your, what you've paid into it. It's just like, the system itself needs to be dwindled out over time because it is a scam. And, That's a Ponzi but, scheme. But like you have been, but you are owed what you are owed in my opinion. Oh, for sure. sure. I agree with that. So speaking of the apocalypse, no, <laughs> the social security apocalypse, uh, Iran and Russia war. Now, if you go on to uh, TikTok or X, there's a constant stream right now online of narratives around a coming World War III scenario with Iran and Russia. And there's a lot of manipulation in the space. So I wanted to dig into it and kind of help people parse this whole thing. I know we're running uh, on a good clip here for, for length. So this might be a epically long podcast, but I think it is important because I think a lot of people are, are getting a lot of stress here. Some of it legitimate, some of it to be very careful of. Uh, there's no real audio to this. Don't worry about it. It's just like plays music, but this has 150,000 views. Um, and it just says, it's just like clips of planes flying <laughs> and landing. A fleet of Russian military cargo planes lands in Iran to support it against the US. Alert sign, breaking news, Russia versus US in the Middle East. I'm There's, so fucking scared right now. <laughs> Look at that very scary airplane landing. Um, and there are stories there that that is relying on. It's just that they're kind of old and it kind of updates it and kind of like there's like this constant cycle around of, of, of I think that's a legitimate fear of an escalation of regional tensions and the U.S. getting involved in that. And we do have some other stuff that happened with that. So we'll start in Russia. Uh, specifically within the last month. Two weeks ago, Russia staged a counteroffensive, uh, pushing into Russian territory of Kursk. Uh, I have an image of it and a video. We can kind of look at both because they kind of show different Sorry. stuff. Ukraine pushed a counteroffensive? Yeah, Ukraine pushed you, a counteroffensive. You said Russia pushed a counteroffensive. Oh, my into bad. Into Russian Sorry, territory. Guys. My bad. I need more. Just, just I need more liquid. Clarifying my for mouth's listeners. Dry. Yeah, sorry. So this kind of demonstrates the bulge. <laughs> 
if you will. Um, uh, yeah. Are we not saying phrasing anymore? <laughs> of uh, The blue line here is Ukraine. Uh, the rest is Russia, uh, where it was a continuous line kind of going from the top left to the bottom right. It has now been pushed outward uh, into Russian territory. Now, so far, the entire fight has really been happening on Ukrainian territory. You have that red line that goes through it, kind of demonstrates what the old border was and how it's been pushed out. The uh, video kind of shows uh, the overtime of this offensive of Ukraine of the Ukrainian push. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, obviously the colors get flipped to the blue and then the kind of different color red versus the red of, of Russia. So wait, what was that? What's that? They just put a little fire emoji. Yeah. Wow. That was a major Ooh. battle there. I think major is what battle. that meant to be. Yeah. Um, and if you go to the other one, it does say some of the specific battles, some of the images. Um, and I want to note that the U.S. news covered this as, uh, okay, so why is this happening? Like the question, that's one of the major questions. Why is this the tactic right now in Ukraine? People are kind of seeing this as an escalation. Um, it might be or it might not be. It might be an actual, it's an escalation in the sense of like, it obviously pushes back. Uh, it More Russians are now at danger. More Russians are dying. Uh, actually, just a couple of days ago, one of the largest captures of Russian troops by Ukraine happened. Um but it is also interpreted by lots of people, including lots of people that we like and are kind of view it the same way we do when it comes to the history and the background of this war as, quote, a move that Russian President Vladimir Putin said was aiming to improving Kiev's negotiating position ahead of possible talks and slowing the Russian advance forces along the Ukrainian front. So it's a way to divert and push back against Russia, make them for you know defend their own territory, and it puts Ukraine into a better negotiating position for an actual uh, end of the war. Well, and there's there's like the common adage, and I keep seeing this on Twitter, is people saying getting into Russia is easy; it's getting out of Russia that's hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's just traditionally historically. Yeah. So when asked about it, what was strange about this story is how many like NATO and U.S people were kind of caught off guard, obviously, by this move when it happened. It was kind of came as a surprise. Uh, I don't think it was a surprise, but a lot of people were saying like, oh, that's what they're doing. That's interesting. You know, like it was kind of playing dumb, maybe. Um, it, we have this report from antiwar.com that suggested that obviously the Kursk offensive might not be sustainable. Uh, NATO countries think Ukraine won't be able to hold territory uh, in Russia's Kursk. So I have a question. If, if Ukrainian troops were in such disarray as we kind of have perceived them to be over the last several months. Mm -hmm. How is it that they have been able to execute this against Russia at it's, this moment? It's, it seems to be, and, I, and I'm not a military expert, so take it with a grain of salt, but it seems to me mostly drone and uh, um, armor, armor. Mm, tanks yeah, and tanks. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Ro robot warfare. I mean, well, that's all they have left to go on, isn't it, at this point? I mean, like... And war dolphins. And we've got war <laughs> dolphins. <laughs> we've got we got spy whales, which are very effective. But those uh, are those are Russian inland. spy whales. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah those yeah, are Russian yeah. spy whales. We don't whales. have no evidence of uh, uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian spy whales. That said, we didn't have any evidence of Ukrainian war dolphins <laughs> until this week. Well, so Ukraine. We don't know what they got cooking Ukraine up there. Ukraine isn't in good whale migration territory. <laughs> right. Right. This is right. all Black Sea stuff for yeah. the most part. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Which with is, the whales that's the more dolphin territory. <laughs> It's wow. like the blood in the crypts over here. Yeah. I didn't okay. know you were such a dolphin expert. This is well, well I, I mean, whales are in the ocean. They're not going to be in the Black Sea, but Russia just has a lot more water. Kyle's, to Kyle's a penguin. He knows all about dolphins. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Just, you know, they don't, and, they don't get along. And yeah. whales. whales. Natural well, enemy. Uh, whales. My, my <laughs> habitat is Antarctica, so <laughs> like, I don't deal with this northern hemisphere nonsense. So... Uh, it's more like the wall ride that we have problems. The wall <laughs> and the ride. seals. <laughs> Leopard seals. Yeah. Whoa. Don't mind me. Party we foul. We got a party here. foul. Yeah, yeah. What that do you was mean? Up. Holy Straight cow. out of the fridge. Anyway. Yikes. Carry on. Carry right, on. Don't no worry problem. about me. All right. So it isn't that. Okay. So there is threat of an escalation because of this, right? There, that's Those are the natural fears there. But I don't think that this changes the dynamic of the war to such a degree that we're going to see you know, American troops in Ukraine to like finish this off, right? Uh, if it can't be held, it seems more likely that this is a maneuver for negotiation. So a lot of the panic there is probably like manage your expectations. The question is, is what's going on in the Middle East with Iran and Israel? So last month, Israel kills a Hamas leader, Ismail Hen Henia. 
Man, that, that was the names. that was the bomb in the in Tehran, in Tehran. like mm-hmm. in the capital well, planted city months ahead of time. Yeah, which is uh, also a crazy part. So of it. this is some Mossad shit, right? Mm-hmm. Before that, they killed the Hezbollah leader. Uh, was killed in Israel in Beirut. That's the capital of Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon. I did the organ version of it. Uh, my bad. And I want to, so, so the, the, the point here is that there are a lot of people around this additionally. So like Monday this week, French president Emmanuel Macron and German chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, this is from Al Jazeera, uh, and the prime minister Keir Starmer issued a joint statement calling for de-escalation. Uh, quote, we call on Iran and its allies to refrain from attacks that would further escalate regional tensions and jeopardize the opportunity to agree to a ceasefire in Gaza and release Israeli hostages. So there is like this, you know, obviously Israel, I, I mean, think uh, Seymour Hirsch called it uh, Bibi's assassination spree, where he's like all these uh, attacks are going across the region. Israel seems to be kind of like pushing as this is part of their war on Gaza uh, against uh, Hamas. And then we have the U.S. response, which is kind of simultaneously in line with Emmanuel Macron. You have Biden kind of saying we don't want a regional war, a large regional war, while providing weapons and now committing new American combat ships, including an aircraft character and an attack submarine and thousands of U.S. Marines to be deployed to the Middle East. Now, a lot of the reporting on that says this means the war is coming or the real thing is coming. But I don't, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um Additionally, that we do have, going back to that TikTok video, Russia delivering weapons to Iran. Um, mostly, these are what we'd call defensive weapons. These are, uh, these are like Iron Dome-like weapons to prevent uh, people from being able to shoot missiles into their country. Sure. Um, specifically, in this case, uh, ISIS, uh, uh, Israel. But also, 25 Su-35 fighter jets which were set to be sold to Egypt, but then as of like almost almost a year ago, were then diverted to Iran for reasons. To right? Iran? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, from, from, from Russia. Oh, from Russia. And sure, so sure. It, what it's kind of worked out to is uh, uh, Iran's been selling drones to Russia and Russia has been selling missile defense and heavy air weaponry to Iran. Hmm. So what does this mean? Is World War III imminent? Well, we do have Lindsey Graham introducing an AOMF for war against Iran at the same time, right? So that's another kind of touch point where the reporting on that says, like, here it comes. It's going to happen. Like, the apocalypse is imminent. Um, Can we just give Iran him? (laughs) Here you go. Just, just fire if you love Iran, if, if you want to go to war with Iran, just send yeah, him over there. Yeah. Just airdrop him in. Lindsey Graham just got the helmet and everything. Just uh, yes. in. Right. Rambo. That would, that would be great. Rambo Graham. So to answer your question. <laughs> Grambo. Grambo. <laughs> Rambo. <laughs> Lindsey Grambo. I love it. So if 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 the if the wider regional war is going to happen, I mean it's always possible, right? This is going to always escalatory spiral out of control. But we do know that as of a couple, what was it, last year? Uh, Iran shoots all of these weapons at Israel, it's shot down by America and various different purchased American allies across the region. Um, but that was obviously very heavily signaled by Iran, like, here's when we're going to do it and here's who we're going to shoot it at so that you know. Um, and all this happened two weeks ago, right? Like all these assassinations and things like that. Though arms sales pre-exist a lot of this, this isn't like an emergency response to what happened two weeks ago. Like the S-35 jets, those happened, those were deals that were cut a long time ago. All, all the military industrial complex stock has been... Yes. Roof lately. And for, for those reasons too, that's another yeah. part, that's Lockheed another Martin angle of the reporting everybody. saying the apocalypse is near right, for those things. Uh, something that I think is important for people to grasp. Cause I, I don't, when, when I hear people talk about Iran, I, I, I kind of forget that most people think that Iran is just like Iraq or Afghanistan where it's like, okay, we're dealing with a bunch of Bedouins and, you know, and like, it's just like a bunch of like Bedouin sheep farmers that is like, oh, America can take that. No, Iran is a much different story than Iraq and Afghanistan. Like I don't, people don't really have that conceptually in their mind. They just kind of think it's all the same thing. Iran is way more advanced, has way more military structures, way more anti-air. I mean, it's kind of like our thing is we, we got air, um, way more mountainous region. Like the terrain is much, is much more difficult. More, more similar to Afghanistan than Iraq. In that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Um, but like, but even just when we're talking about the structure and like the political structure of the place, like everything is much more difficult to deal with. Like an, a, a, a war with Iran is not war with Afghanistan or a war with Iraq. It, we're talking a much different scales here, mm -hmm. but people kind of just equate them all in the same uh, mm -hmm. wavelength. Yeah. Well, maybe most people from the U.S. probably couldn't put their finger on Iran. Yeah, there's like somewhere you know? in there. Yeah, it's over yeah. there. There's really yeah. bad guys that we don't like right. over there. Yeah. 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 But it's just because we've had two decades of people seeing the of what the other war on terror stuff looked like uh, and everything in the Middle East. And I think people have a very skewed image of their mind yeah. of who's being fought if we went to Iran in comparison, because they're used to just being like, oh, there's a bunch of dudes in robes, you know, like it's not the same thing. Right. right? With like, some AK-47s from the 80s. Way and... more technical prowess in Iran. Larger right? populations, uh, longer time developing. I mean, under the Shah, Iran was a not a first world country, but a very high income country mm -hmm. in that, at that time and continues to have a very large domestic econo economy. Uh, um, that because of U.S. policy pressure over the years has integrated with Russia specifically because we're also putting sanctions over the same period of time on Russia, right? So we've forced these, just like China and Russia, we've forced these two together. And so obviously they're now interoperable militarily and economically because we've put them in that role, yeah. right? Now, I'm not saying that Iran's all a bunch of guys who just want peace and they're all just nice, friendly, happy no. unicorns and blowjobs. I'm saying it's... <laughs> It's uh, with goats. <laughs> with goats. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Christ. No, sorry. That, that, that's Afghanistan. So. Okay, cause, but that's what people have in their mind. Yeah, they, have they have that have type mind, of stuff right. in mind, right? Right, right. They have like, Iran's way more of a sophisticated nation. <laughs> yes. So it's not saying that. It's just saying that our posture has consistently been that they're an enemy because of stuff that happened way back in the 1950s and 60s. Sure. Which we don't have to get into because we've done that a thousand times. Do you think that they're pushing this right now, this war with Iran? now before the election because they think if trump gets elected since he has this posture of if i was president this war wouldn't have happened that war wouldn't have happened that he's not going to be as hawkish as they would like to be in his administration could be so so if, yeah. if it starts before he comes in assuming he's going to be elected they can at least it'll be easier to continue it if we're already involved one of my concerns was always going to be that um Biden would either resign ahead of time or get 25th amendment out. And then, it, then Kamala would become, pre become president and she would have to do this. Like I'm a woman, I'm tough, you mm. know, posturing yeah. and do some really reckless stuff. I, I, that's always been a concern that I've had. It really worked out in Bucharest in 2020, let me tell you, yeah. 21. I mean, uh, but yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. It's, it's uh, there's a real fear that in order to prove something or to maintain power, presidents start wars or drop bombs like that's right. known um so anyways I, I think the see if you look at seymour hirsch's reporting on this specifically and i think anti-war follows a, a similar path in many ways there's a lot of regional pressures to keep this from happening turkey doesn't want this to happen iran doesn't want this to happen i mean even despite being more sophisticated than iraq or afghanistan they still don't want you know the u.s military presence blowing up their country like that would be disastrous for the people and, and, and at stake and i'm not sure that they see this they see this as an ideological war like with the patina right of the ideological war of uh the house of islam and the treatment of the palestinians which is sympathetic with and i totally understand where they're kind of trying to gather a uh, positive sentiment of the muslim world to expand shia dominance and control over their area and where they're at in the middle east not as like Russia does with Ukraine as an existential war. Keep in mind, Iran now has all of Iraq as a buffer between them and Israel and Saudi Arabia, right? They're a fellow Shia state, right? Mm -hmm. In a war situation, where are all those Shia militias going to go? Mm -hmm. Not to the public government in Baghdad. They're going right. to go to Iran. Yeah. So th th they're not in the same geostrategic position that our Russia is where they it really, they have to go to war is how they see it uh, yeah. at that position. We've known that about Russia since the net means net memo going all the way back uh, to Hillary Clinton as, as secretary of state. Yeah. So like we shouldn't understand them as the same position and therefore kind of weigh that differently when we're doing our realism assessment of this whole situation. So that is how uh, at least when you're thinking about this panic reporting and this like constant trickle of it's going to happen, apocalypse is going to happen in World War Three, 
I'm not saying it can't. I'm just saying be careful about how much energy you're putting into that because there's a lot of countervailing pressures that aren't reported, that aren't going to be there because it doesn't make any sense for any of the actors to to kind of do that. Noting last time, Iran basically said, hey, we're going to strike you back and then did so specifically so that it, they could be shut down so they could look good to the, to the Muslim majority Sa- population. It's a safe face to move. Yeah, right? while actually trying to take... For when uh, Israel hit Syria, the embassy in Syria, and yes. killed the diplomat. Right. Yes. So that way, and without escalating tensions, right? So Iran is not some crazy... Iran does that a lot. It, it, it's the tick for tack, realist, uh, you know, foreign policy, geopolitical stuff where you're just like, well, you did this, so we need to, we need to take a piece. And it's just like that tick for tack diplomacy mm-hmm. type of stuff that yeah. goes on to yeah. save face, but also to be able to posture strongly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good, uh, good white pill, you know, that maybe World War Three isn't imminent uh, as much as we, uh, you know, might think. And hopefully it's not. But there's always the risk. But there's always yeah. the Life risk. Life is full of risks. So, Everything's probabilities. So live every day like it might be your last, <laughs> but, but hold out hope. Uh, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up today. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Stick around for the skiff. We're going to be talking about some great topics today. If you want to know about how to become a member, humanreactionpod.com. If you haven't yet, please do like, subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a review. On behalf of David Rand, Kyle Mack, and Bennett, my name is Joe Sheehan. This is Human Reaction. And Liam. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Please be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to become a member and support the show financially, check out humanreactionpod.com. And remember... And we did things and said things through this president with a low IQ, very low IQ. He had a low IQ 30 years ago, by the way, but now he might not even have a (laughs) IQ at all. There is nothing on the board that goes this low.